If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 1, Asmodeus One ordinary morning by the river, an extraordinary child lay. At first glance, one might think he was lifeless, but that wasn't the case. Almost as if refusing to succumb to death, the teenager spat out the water that had accumulated in his lungs and coughed. Cough, cough. After clearing the water and somewhat regaining composure, the child opened his eyes. Asmodeus surveyed his surroundings and couldn't comprehend where he was. The altered size of his own body bewildered him, it had clearly diminished. Before he could ponder the possible reasons for such changes, he felt a sharp pain in his shoulder. Hiss. Asmodeus struggled to contain the pain. A spearhead protruded from his left shoulder, clearly embedded deeply. Examining his body, he realized it was the only external injury. Settling into a more comfortable position, with support for his right hand, Asmodeus began to count down. One. Two. Three. On the count of three, he started extracting the spear from the wound, proceeding slowly due to serrations on the blade. Pulling it out too quickly would cause more harm than good. Clenching his teeth, he finally removed the spearhead and placed it nearby. Setting aside the spearhead, he examined the wound as best he could. Seeing that the bones were untouched, flames ignited in Asmodeus's palm. He pressed his hand against the wound and intensified the flames. Hum. It was painful, but he stood firm. After finishing the treatment, Asmodeus rose to his feet. First, he surveyed the surroundings. It was astonishing for him to see European-style cottages in an old English fashion. Spotting an evidently European village nearby, he muttered to himself. Wrong. I was in the Kingdom of Earth, those fools attacked me. How did I end up in Europe? This isn't even the same world. Well, at least I'm free from further battles. Observing the sun, now at its peak and about to set soon, Asmodeus muttered to himself, First, I need to find a place to rest. Gathering his clothes, now oddly ill-fitting, Asmodeus headed towards what seemed to be an abandoned structure by the river. Approaching it, he identified it as an old pigsty surprisingly clean despite its apparent neglect. Inside, he found a secluded corner shielded from prying eyes and scattered some hay. Luck was on his side, and the summer warmth provided comfort in his improvised shelter. Asmodeus, very fatigued, instantly fell asleep. Fortunately, whether the pigsty was far from the main village or simply unwanted, the night passed peacefully. He woke up the next morning. Asmodeus rose, cracked his stiff bones, checked the recently cauterized wound, and went to the river to wash. Dried by the sun, Asmodeus thought, I must find something to eat and learn about this world. Feeling gold coins in his pocket, similar to Japanese yen, he realized he needed to exchange them for local currency first. In any case, gold was valued everywhere, well, almost everywhere. Doubting that he could find currency exchange or gold in the remote village, Asmodeus headed towards the village center a small square paved with stone. Despite receiving strange glances, he felt a mixture of sympathy and disgust but paid no attention to them. He thought to himself, even though I've washed my clothes, I still look like a beggar who just stole them. Especially since my attire is meant for a 20-year-old, not a 12-13-year-old. Strolling through the square, Asmodeus noticed a road leading to a small railway station. He speculated that there might be an information bureau there and headed in that direction. Arriving at the station, he joyfully noticed the information bureau and the station's name, Risby Railway Station. Now I know I'm in England but it seems to be not the England of my first world, more like England in the 70s to 90s of the 20th century, Asmodeus pondered. Although he could already guess from the conversations in the square that they were in English, at that moment, he focused on finding directions and paid no attention to the language. Approaching the information desk, where a woman in her 50s sat, he spoke in impeccable British English in his first life, Asmodeus spent a lot of time in England as an exchange student. Now, he blended in seamlessly with the locals. Good afternoon, may I ask you where I am and how far I am from London? Initially unaware of who was addressing her, the woman got up and saw a 13-year-old child. Are you alone, little boy? Where are your parents? And you're talking about London, it is quite far away. How did you get here? Asmodeus, momentarily stunned by the barrage of questions, quickly composed himself and replied, Good afternoon, miss. I don't know how I ended up here. My name is... Before revealing his name, Asmodeus fell silent. Hmm, he pondered, 
unsure of the reaction to his surname and whether he should mention it. Child, don't you remember your name? Oh well, he thought, and said, my name is Asmodeus Morningstar. That's all I remember. I seem to have amnesia. In his mind, Asmodeus reasoned that this was the best answer, as he certainly had no relatives in England in the 90s, and he was sure that nobody knew him in this new world. Oh, what a poor child. Come, child, I will take you to the police station, they will help you there, she said. Initially relieved that there was no reaction to his surname, Asmodeus thought about the possibilities in this world. Does this world lack that name, just like the second world he lived in? Who knows, the multiverse is infinite. Realizing he had nothing to worry about, Asmodeus asked, Miss, what about your job? She replied, laughing, Haha, don't worry. You're the first person to contact me in the last three weeks. Come on, your situation is much more important than a potential one person coming to ask when the next train is, and there's a scoreboard for that. Half an hour later, Asmodeus found himself at the police station, patiently waiting for Mrs. Peggins to explain his situation to a policeman. When an officer approached, Asmodeus stood up. The middle-aged man said, Hello kid, let's go to my office and talk. I think we can help you. In the office, repeating his story of amnesia, Asmodeus observed the thoughtful policeman and patiently waited. After a couple of minutes, the man stood up and said, OK, kid. I'll contact the London police station. I think they will pick you up and try to find shelter for you. Hopefully, your parents will find you soon. Expressing gratitude, Asmodeus was provided with temporary accommodation at the police station. Within a week, he was living at St. Mary's, a well-funded state-run orphanage. There, he chose to keep his magic and special abilities a secret, maintaining a low profile as he contemplated his next steps. What is the name of this child? Asmodeus Norin Morningstar, she said. What an interesting name, Dumbledore mused, don't you think? All right, Minerva, don't worry. Send him a letter, and I will personally go meet him when he responds. Chapter 2, And Again I Found Myself in an Unusual World The next morning, Asmodeus blinked as he stared at the owl perched on his table, holding a letter in its claws. He thought. No, not again. I've just escaped from an avatar world with constant war, and now I found myself in a world of noseless beings. All right, come here, he said to the owl and gave her a nut in exchange for the letter. Opening the letter with a distinctive emblem of four animals, he read. Dear Mr. Asmodeus Morningstar, we are pleased to inform you that you have been accepted to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Please find enclosed a list of required books and equipment. Classes commence on September 1st. We await your owl no later than July 31 st. Having read the letter, Asmodeus bitterly smiled and thought to himself, well, maybe it's for the best. At least I won't have to hide my fire magic. Yes, fire magic. You heard it right. Asmodeus, originally an 18-year-old teenager whose life was cut short by a familiar truck, was reborn in the world of Avatar, the last airbender, precisely at the beginning of the Fire Nation's war against the rest of the world. You can consider firebending not as the magic of fire but as a form of martial art. Yet, all extraordinary powers share one root, the manipulation of energy. In essence, magic is not vastly different from advanced martial arts, such as body enhancement spells. The distinction between cultivators lies in the permanence of body tempering, while wizards of body enhancement schools strengthen themselves temporarily. In reality, both involve manipulating energy through will, movements, and intellect. For Asmodeus, whether it's magic in the world of Harry Potter or firebending, it's essentially the same manipulation of energy through will, movements, and emotions. In the realm of Harry Potter, magic requires emotions and wand movements, while firebenders use full body movements and also rely on emotions when releasing energy. In fact, everything traces back to a common origin, manipulating energies. Asmodeus differs from the natives due to his lineage a lineage from the Fire Nation passed down by ancestors. This lineage was once bestowed upon them by the Lion Turtle, thus inclined towards the fire element. Interestingly, the Lion Turtle resembles wizards from the world of Harry Potter, possessing great wisdom and knowledge as the guardian of the most mysterious magic the magic of energy that predates the invention of the other four magics. Therefore, the Lion Turtle can manipulate any energy available in the world, resembling a traditional wizard in many ways. In the world of Avatar Asmodeus was a renowned prodigy, capable of wielding lightning magic 
but he didn't share the Fire Nation's ambitions. Choosing to escape to the Earth Kingdom, he was mistaken for a spy, attacked, and, in his attempts to disarm rather than harm his assailants, got injured. As he fled, he stumbled into a peculiar rift in the mountains, transporting him into the world of Harry Potter. But his reflections on the past were interrupted by the Owl, already disgruntled by the meager payment of just one nut for her services. Now, she had to wait for this peculiar red-eyed, bald monkey to respond to the letter. Oh, sorry about that, Asmodeus said with a smile and took a pen in hand. In his response, he expressed his delight at being accepted to the magical school but explained that he couldn't simply leave the orphanage without saying anything and was unsure how to proceed. Handing the letter to the owl, he waited for a response. In the evening, he saw the familiar disgruntled owl again and opened the letter. Dear Asmodeus Morningstar, we are delighted that you have chosen to attend our school. On Thursday at 1300 hours, one of the professors will come to explain the situation to your guardians and accompany you for school shopping. Do not worry about funds, as the school has a special program to assist students. Asmodeus thought. Thursday. Today is Monday, which means three more days. I need to try to prepare the caretaker, Anna, in advance. Anna Berkman, an elderly lady who had taken care of him for the past month at the orphanage, treated him very well and he didn't want the Hogwarts professor to deceive her. Therefore, the next day, early in the morning, he found Mrs. Berkman and said, Grandma Anna, I have something to talk to you about. When would you be free? What's up, little one? I'm free now, replied the woman with a kind smile on her face. Although she had aged, the natural beauty of her youth shone through the wrinkles. Grandma Anna, can we talk alone? Yes, of course, dear. Follow me. After fifteen minutes in the room near the kitchen. So, you're saying you're a wizard, and you've been accepted to a magic school? The old lady said with a smile. Yes, Asmodeus replied. He understood how it sounded, so he promptly demonstrated his abilities. He made a few strikes in the air. At first, Miss Berkman thought the child was playing, but when she saw flames forming at the end of the child's fist and him dancing with them, she admitted she was wrong. The old lady was shocked and asked, how did you do that? Asmodeus replied, it's fire magic. She inquired, but don't you have amnesia? And gave him an appraising look. Asmodeus responded, yes, I do have amnesia, but fire magic is like an instinct for me. It's as if I've known how to use it since birth. Haha, <laughs> from birth, Asmodeus thought to himself. If only you knew how I studied for twenty years, it would feel like instinct for you too. However, he kept this thought to himself. All right, little one, you've convinced me. So, what about this magic school? Asmodeus shared everything he could from the letter, being careful not to reveal too much. After all, a child with amnesia shouldn't know about the magical world, especially when he already looks suspicious due to his knowledge of using fire magic. Miss Anna listened to all of this and asked, Are you absolutely sure you want to go? You know you don't have any friends there and you'll be alone in an unfamiliar world. At least here, we have our caregivers from the orphanage. Asmodeus was touched by her kindness and concern, but he still replied, Grandma, I think I can give Hogwarts a try. If I want to, I can leave at any time and come back to you. But I want to see what the magical world looks like. As you wish, little one. We'll be happy to welcome you back if you decide to return. Asmodeus nodded and said nothing more. Chapter 3 why the hell did you show up now? Thursday, 12.50, and Asmodeus was already standing in front of the orphanage, waiting for the professor. He thought, I wonder who they'll send to fetch me? An old bat? Maybe a cat girl who's seen better days? Or a dueling master with high-level dodging skills compensating for their short stature? Perhaps Professor Sprout? She'd probably enjoy playing Plants vs. Zombies. His musings were interrupted by a clap as if a rift in space had occurred. Asmodeus looked up and saw an elderly man with bright sky-blue eyes. In his thoughts, he pondered, what the hell? Since when does the headmaster personally recruit students? Then, he heard, Asmodeus Norin Morningstar? I am Albus Dumbledore, the headmaster of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Asmodeus was in shock, not because of Dumbledore's introduction but due to the dark golden screen hanging in front of his eyes with the message you are in direct contact with a wizard of this world, loading the system of development and merging of worlds. Asmodeus paid no attention to Dumbledore, 
all that occupied his thoughts was the screen. In his mind, he screamed with joy and anger, yes, my golden finger, finally, twenty years later. But I have a question for this system with bad internet why the hell did you appear only now? I've been through the transition for the second time, and you only deign to show up. All right, now is not the time, especially since the system is still loading. I need to deal with the upcoming matters first, he thought, having heard Dumbledore addressing him. What's the matter, my boy? Are you surprised by my appearance? No, replied Asmodeus, but I don't understand why the headmaster of the school personally comes to pick up a student. Ah ha it's because of you, your situation compelled me to come personally, chuckled Dumbledore. Asmodeus furrowed his brow, wondering what situation Dumbledore was talking about. Dumbledore explained, you're twelve, turning thirteen soon, but students at Hogwarts typically enroll at eleven. There was only one incident when a student joined later, one hundred years ago, but that's not the point now. You, young man, likely awakened your magical abilities later than usual, so our acceptance book couldn't register you earlier. Asmodeus thought to himself, of course it couldn't register me, I wasn't even in this world. But he asked, so, what do we do now? Can I still enroll? Dumbledore replied, certainly, you can. It's not that big of a problem. You'll just be taller than your classmates. He looked at the almost 13-year-old boy who already stood at 170 centimeters tall. So, shall we go? Asked Asmodeus. Yes, we need to buy many things today, but first, I need to talk to your guardians, said the old man. Dumbledore headed towards the orphanage. After 15 minutes, Dumbledore came out and assessed the boy with an evaluating look. He asked, young man. Miss Anna told me that you can already use magic and demonstrated it to her. Can you show me? Asmodeus nodded. He didn't want to hide his fire magic, he had lived with it for twenty years and was accustomed to using it as people are to their phones nowadays. However, he asked, Professor, what if someone notices? Don't worry, Dumbledore reassured, I've cast a muggle-repelling charm, no one will notice you. He gestured for Asmodeus to proceed. Without further questions, Asmodeus began showcasing his fire magic, dancing and conjuring flames, reminiscent of the intro to the old cartoon Avatar, The Last Airbender. Dumbledore didn't conceal his amazement, he applauded and said, Remarkable. You use magic without a wand, and it seems entirely intentional, not like the little wizards during a magical tantrum. Where did you learn this? Your movements look like you've practiced a lot. Asmodeus replied, I don't know. I've been able to control fire for as long as I can remember, and I've never needed those wands. As for the movements, I copied them from Bruce Lee, I saw a movie with him in it. Asmodeus didn't expect Dumbledore to use legilimency on everyone, unlike Voldemort, especially since he didn't display combat strength beyond what the old bee could handle. Asmodeus knows he wouldn't be able to handle Dumbledore or Voldemort in a fight, but he's confident in facing Snape on equal terms. Currently, he revealed only a fraction of his power saving high-level fire magic, explosion magic, or lightning magic for another time. All right, little pyromaniac, take my hand, get ready, it might be a bit nauseating for the first time. Dumbledore said and teleported them to a bar called Leaky Cauldron. Asmodeus stood, retching in the corner of the bar, while Dumbledore and everyone else watched with a smile. Damn it, he thought, this is horrible, who came up with such inhumane magic? Chapter 4, Diagon Alley all right, Asmodeus, you seem to have recovered. Follow me. You see that bin, follow the sequence. Dumbledore tapped his wand on some stones in the wall, and it started to disassemble, revealing an entrance to a new world, vastly different from the London where Asmodeus had spent the last month and a half. Asmodeus looked around and saw various shops with peculiar names. He heard many strange names of potions offered by the sellers. Someone even shouted something about a dragon's heart and liver. Dumbledore said, let's go, I'll take you to buy a wand first. It's the most important thing for a wizard in our time, though maybe not for you. They walked peacefully for three to five minutes until they reached an old, or rather ancient, if the sign was to be believed, shop. All Ivander since 382 BC. The best wands. Asmodeus doubted this claim but didn't say anything. They entered the shop, and the bell rang to announce new customers. From the far corner of the shop, a slightly hoarse voice could be heard saying. I'm coming, wait a moment. A few minutes later, 
Asmodeus saw an elderly grey-eyed man who said, Oh, Albus, it's been a while since I've seen you. Your wand certainly doesn't need any service. Dumbledore replied, Garrick, I've come to you not alone, and this young wizard needs a wand. Hey? Ollivander asked, are eleven year olds so tall now? Asmodeus raised his head and answered, I'm thirteen, but I've never bought a wand before. Strange, Ollivander replied, but I'm not concerned about that. Come on, my boy, tell me which hand you use. While Ollivander asked, a tape measure was already flying around Asmodeus, measuring him everywhere. He said, right hand, sir. Ollivander mumbled in response, hmm, right-handed. All right, let me have a look. And he walked back into the depths of the store. Let's see, try these. Ollivander pulled out a couple of wands and handed them to Asmodeus. This one is oak, 14 inches, phoenix feather core. It's for those with strong convictions, good for transfiguration. As soon as Asmodeus took the wand in his hands, he felt as if a tributary had emerged in the stream of inner energy within his body, and the energy flowed in that direction. However, he distinctly sensed that this tributary was not strong enough to contain the fiery energy in his blood. Just as he contemplated this, the wand in his hand ignited. Yet, it wasn't a mere tip flare as if triggered by a spell, on the contrary, the entire wand emitted streams of flame, resembling molten metal. Within a couple of seconds, only ashes remained from the wand. Dumbledore and Ollivander observed this, blinking and exchanging glances between themselves. Um, what was that? Asmodeus asked, looking at Ollivander. I would like to know that too, Ollivander said, glancing at the ashes on the ground before turning his gaze to Dumbledore. Dumbledore, with a twinkle in his eye, looked at both of them and asked Asmodeus. What did you feel when you took the wand? He replied, well, it felt like I had a lake, and someone dug a canal to my lake intending to divert it to their house to steal my water. Turns out, there's an underground spring in my lake, and it occasionally erupts. After two of these eruptions, heartbeats, the house and canal were flooded and destroyed. Dumbledore raised his eyebrows in surprise, listening to Asmodeus' analogy. Ollivander, in turn, leaned in to closely examine the ashes on the ground. Interesting description, said Dumbledore. This might be a sign of overly strong magic within you. I also noticed a clear dominance of fire elements in your magical energy. But, I'm confident Ollivander will find a suitable wand for you. Ollivander stood up and said, Don't worry, young man. I have a few more options. Let's try others. I need to think. You mentioned that the wand's power was insufficient, I believe you should try wands made from dragon heartstrings since, as we saw, the phoenix feather was too delicate for you. You need a wand that can withstand the enormous reservoir of magic within you and the abundance of fire elements. Here's a 13.5-inch acacia wand with a core of heartstring from a fiery dragon. It's highly flexible and powerful, suitable for dueling. Give it a try, said Ollivander. After a few seconds, Ollivander was looking at a new pile of ashes on the floor and turned his gaze to Dumbledore, whose mouth corners were already twitching. He asked. Did you bring him here to seek revenge on me for haggling over the price of fox feathers last time? No, of course not. I would never do such a thing. The main question is, what do we do now? Said Dumbledore. Ollivander replied, go buy everything else and come back to me at 5 p.m. I'll try to look for something. But I can't guarantee it will be suitable. Dumbledore said, all right, we'll be back at 5. Let's go, Asmodeus we have a lot to buy. When they opened the door, they saw a man with platinum hair ascending the steps in front of the shop, accompanied by a child around 10 to 11 years old. Hello, Dumbledore. It's quite remarkable that the school headmaster personally selects a wand for a student. I wonder what's happening. Greeted Lucius. Hello, Lucius. I don't think my affairs should concern you until I'm at school. Come, Asmodeus, we need to go to the bookstore, said Dumbledore leading the way. Dumbledore, although polite in most cases, holds disdain for those like Malfoy, people who waver in their allegiance. You never know his exact position. He didn't want the Board of Governors to learn about the child possibly missed by the acceptance book, as it would be considered a director's negligence. Even though Dumbledore never personally handled student admissions leaving it to the magical quill and book he knew former Death Eaters could find any excuse to cause him trouble. Chapter 5, Unwanted Attention 
ignoring the unpleasant encounter at the store, Asmodeus and Dumbledore headed to the second-hand goods store. As Asmodeus mentioned, he didn't want to spend too much on books that could be borrowed from the school library if his own was not in good condition. They bought a cauldron, books, quills, dragon hide gloves, and various other items that might be needed at school. Before returning to Ollivander's shop, Dumbledore handed him a pouch of gold coins and said, Here's your share, deducting the 54 galleons you spent. You'll have 46 gold galleons left. Plus, you need to buy a wand don't worry about the cost. All first year wands are only 7 galleons. So, you'll still have money left for sweets. At the beginning of the next school year, you'll receive another 100 galleons. This is the allowance allocated by the school for orphaned children. Don't worry, you don't have to return it, but try to save some. There's an hour left until 5 o'clock, do you want to join me for some candy shopping? Don't worry, it's on me. Of course, yes. Let's go, replied Asmodeus. While the young and the old strolled through Diagon Alley, the young scion of the Malfoy family had only one question in his mind, who was the teenager that even the headmaster himself took out for shopping. Although the Malfoys don't hold Dumbledore in high regard, they certainly fear him. That's why both the elder and younger Malfoy noticed Asmodeus and decided to figure out who he was. Entering Ollivander's shop and exchanging greetings with the only wand maker in England. Lucius inquired, Mr. Ollivander, who was that just now? Who are you asking about? You don't know Dumbledore. I wasn't asking about Dumbledore but about the child beside him. And why would you need to know that, Mr. Malfoy? I don't disclose information about my customers. No, no, Mr. Ollivander, said Lucius. I'm just asking out of curiosity. It's rare to see Dumbledore personally accompanying a student in Diagon Alley, so I'm curious. Well, I think he brought him to get back at me for lowering the price of Phoenix Feathers last time, mumbled Ollivander, but Lucius overheard. What are you talking about, Mr. Ollivander? What do you mean get back at you? All right, I don't think it matters much, so I'll tell you. See those two handfuls of ashes in the corner? Ollivander pointed to the left corner of the room. Yes, replied Lucius, his face displaying confusion. Those are wands I let that kid try. His magical power is so immense that my poor wands burned up. He didn't even get a chance to wave them. That's why I think Dumbledore is nursing a grudge at me. You're kidding, Mr. Ollivander. How can a young wizard have such powerful magic? Even adult wizards don't have such powers. Not quite like that, Ollivander replied. Actually, the first wand is precious because it grows with the wizard and gradually adapts to their strength and characteristics. So, if you give an elite adult wizard like Dumbledore a wand not crafted for him, there's a chance of such an outcome, usually, the wand simply won't work. But this child has such a strong affinity for the elements of fire that even a phoenix feather wand and a dragon heartstring couldn't withstand it. Lucius Malfoy, upon hearing this, was briefly stunned. He didn't know what to say. In other words, Dumbledore brought a second version of himself to Hogwarts this year? Lucius Malfoy thought, we cannot allow the appearance of a second Dumbledore. This would surely be the end for a pure-blood family. And what if this child doesn't restrain himself and doesn't behave according to the rules? We must suppress him. But how can this be done? First, let's see how he behaves at Hogwarts. Maybe it's not so bad. While the elder Malfoy convinced himself of this, in Draco Malfoy's heart, hearing this ignited a competitive thrill. He was sure he wouldn't lose to this unknown child. So what if Dumbledore brought him? I'm Draco Malfoy, pure blood, my father is on the Hogwarts Board of Governors. I can't lose. He thought. And he said. Mr. Ollivander, let me choose a wand. Although his speech was filled with arrogance, it was not directed at Ollivander, as he too belonged to one of the 28 pure blood families. All right. Young Mr. Malfoy, which hand do you use? Right, Draco answered and extended his hand. As he spoke, Ollivander had already taken measurements and went to the storeroom to select a wand. Before leaving, Ollivander didn't forget to say, Remember, it's not you who chooses the wand, but the wand that chooses you. After a few minutes, returning with a box, Ollivander placed it on the table, pulled out a wand, and handed it to Draco. Draco took the wand, and a light glowed at the tip but there was no ignition or malfunction as Malfoy expected. Instead, Ollivander clapped and said, Excellent, Mr. Malfoy, a perfect match on the first try. 
This wand is 10 inches, unicorn tail core, not too stiff, but not too flexible either. Hearing the wand maker's words, Malfoy was dumbfounded. How can this be? He thought. I'm chosen, I'm a Malfoy. But no one cared about his thoughts. Paying for the wand with glazed eyes, the Malfoy couple left the shop and headed towards the exit of Diagon Alley. Chapter 6, And You Call This a Wand It's a staff. Unaware of the internal tragedy in the Malfoy family, Asmodeus and Dumbledore returned to the wand shop. Upon entering the shop, they saw Garrick Ollivander already waiting for them, holding a massive box that was at least two meters long. Asmodeus, with an eye that twitched slightly, looked at Dumbledore, who, at that moment, turned his gaze to the left, as if he didn't see what was happening. Having calmed down, Asmodeus decided to ask anyway. Mr. Ollivander, are you sure this is a wand? Hey? A wand? No, no, I don't have a wand that can withstand your magic, and I won't have time to make one before the start of classes. There's only a week left, so I decided to search the storage for wands and staffs made by my ancestors, but I found something more interesting. Ollivander said and opened the box. In the box lay a staff, or rather, a pole made of wood, as it was straight without the tapering at the end, like Gandalf's staff. It looked more like a stick, a very long stick. But to Asmodeus, it seemed very familiar so familiar that he didn't want to believe it until he heard Ollivander's words. My great-grandfather found this staff in the mountains a long time ago. Although it looks like a long piece of wood, it has amazing magical conductivity, and, saying this, he shook the staff in his hand and wings and stabilizers unfolded from the side of the staff. Yes, this is an airbender staff from the air temple in the Avatar world. Apparently, just like him, it ended up here by falling somewhere in the mountains. Ollivander, without waiting for Asmodeus to say something, continued. This staff has amazing magic conductivity, and although it doesn't have high compatibility with your fire magic, it is extremely compatible with a certain element wind. That's why I decided to let you try it. In any case, in our time, probably, no one else would need such a huge staff. Ollivander said with a laugh. But, Mr. Ollivander, I won't be able to move in accordance with the gestures when casting spells if I use it, Asmodeus replied. Garrick responded, Young man, do you really think that someone with such talent and a magical reserve like yours needs to follow the book? At this point, Dumbledore nodded and said, Yes, Asmodeus. Your talent in magic cannot be hidden. Moreover, all the best wizards almost never adhere strictly to spell requirements. As long as you master magic well enough, everything will come naturally. Don't worry. How not to worry when everyone has wands from 10 to 14 inches, and I've got a nearly 2 meter staff. Are you mocking me? All right, let's give it a try. If there's no alternative anyway, it's better than starting the study of magic in this world with wandless spells, he thought and said. Let me try. I hope this one won't be more expensive just because it's longer. Raising an eyebrow at Ollivander. Don't worry, we've been selling the first wand for 2,000 years at the price of seven galleons, without exception. That's what you call economic stability. Okay, he replied and took the staff in his hands. Once again, he felt that strange sensation of a new channel for channeling energy in his body. But this time, instead of the whole staff igniting, a stream of flames shot out from the top of the staff, piercing through the roof and leaving a hole several meters in diameter. He immediately dropped the staff upon seeing this, and without the supply of energy, the fire ceased. Dumbledore said, Don't worry, Asmodeus, and waved his hand. A mending spell caused the hole in the roof to mend itself, as if rewinding a video. Convenient magic, thought Asmodeus. At the same time, Ollivander also said, Yes, young man. This is the best I can offer you right now. Maybe if you come next summer and order a custom wand from me, I might be able to help you, but it will be expensive. No need, replied Asmodeus. I like this staff. Paying for the purchase and leaving the store, Asmodeus turned to Dumbledore and said, Professor Dumbledore, because of this staff, I'll need to modify my cloak so I can use it comfortably. Can I do that? Will it be a problem if my attire stands out? Dumbledore chuckled and replied, nothing to worry about, but it might be costly if you want to alter your clothing here in Diagon Alley. I know, he said. I want to buy some threads in the muggle world and sew it myself. Can I do that? Of course there is always someone at Hogwarts enhancing his robes. However, during official gatherings and holidays, 
you'll still have to use the regular black classic wizard robe, all right. All right. So, will you take me home? Yes, hold on to my hand, and I will cast an apparition spell. Asmodeus took a step back and asked, isn't there another option? Dumbledore, laughing, replied, no, and grabbed his hand. Within a second, trying not to make lunch make a reappearance, Asmodeus was on his knees on the grass. Dumbledore was watching him with a smile on his face. All right, see you at the sorting ceremony, Dumbledore said, and operat back to Hogwarts. Leaving Asmodeus to contemplate the essence of being and his hatred for the curse of teleportation. Chapter 7, System On the next morning, Asmodeus woke to the sound of a system update completion notification. Opening his eyes, Asmodeus got up, washed his face, brushed his teeth, and lay back on the bed. System A golden screen appeared before his eyes with the inscription, World Enhancement System. Well, how does this work? Log in. Ding, welcome to the World Enhancement System. Within 15 minutes, Asmodeus had more or less grasped the functions of the system. Firstly, the system would randomly issue tasks for completion. Completing a task would reward points. This was the primary way to accumulate points. Points could be used in the trading center or directly enhance one's characteristics and abilities. However, direct enhancements would cost significantly more than items in the store. The system also included a world transformation level, which increased based on two factors, how much the world deviated from its original direction and the world's own level advancement. The latter included various factors such as the saturation of magical energy, the number of extraordinary powers, the diversity of development directions for world inhabitants, and the average combat power in the world the last factor having the most significant impact. In other words, the stronger the average person in the world, the more points Asmodeus could accumulate. This was the second method of point accumulation, awarded daily. The third method involved achieving goals. However, upon seeing the kind of achievements the system suggested, Asmodeus decided to avoid that path indefinitely. Were they kidding? Purple achievements. Poke Voldemort's nose, how is that even possible? Snatch one-fourth of Dumbledore's beard. Resurrect Lily Evans and make her love Snape again. Blue achievements. Teach two-thirds of Hogwarts to fly without additional objects, doesn't it seem wrong to walk in a wizarding school? Fly to the moon using magic, why can muggles do it, and we can't? And so on. Seeing this, Asmodeus decisively closed the achievements tab. So, there were three ways to earn points, tasks, world development level, and achievements. Next, Asmodeus decided to explore all available options for using accumulated points. There were only three methods of spending points, including the previously mentioned direct improvement of personal characteristics and the trading center. One world enhancement asterisk adding new forces and superpowers to the world. For example, the system suggested introducing energy for developing warriors, allowing more talented muggles to gain specific super abilities and positively impacting the world's average combat power. This would earn Asmodeus points and cost only 1000 points. However, looking at his current three zeros on the account, Asmodeus quietly shed a tear. Two personal enhancement asterisk previously mentioned improvement of personal or pet characteristics. Three trading center asterisk this center contained all possible goods from different worlds. Warehouse updates occurred once a day for free, with the option to accumulate up to three days. Afterward, a fee of 10 points per update was charged until the next day's reset. After inspecting the system and deciding on the potential direction for his development, Asmodeus asked, Hey, is there, anything like, a beginner's starter kit or something? I've been waiting for you for almost 20 years. The system quickly responded. Ding, a special starter package for beginners, providing basic resources and opportunities for a more comfortable start in the new world. Since the current world is assessed as a low magic world with average combat power of 1.5 points, the starter package will be provided for a total of 100 points. Do you accept? Asmodeus, upon hearing this, thought about how quickly his circumstances could change with this system and made a decision, all right, quickly give me that starter package. Asmodeus, excitedly anticipating the contents of his newcomer's package, gave the go-ahead to open it. The system promptly revealed the following items. Ding, a swift wyvern Nargakuga cub from the Monster Hunter world, completely devoted to the host. Ding, 50 points granted for free use. Ding, a cloak suitable for your current combat style. Asmodeus marveled at the unexpected additions, 
eager to explore the potential of his new wyvern companion and utilize the bonus points. Therefore, he immediately summoned the wyvern cub from the system storage. Are you sure about your choice? A living being cannot be returned after being acquired. Absolutely sure. With the familiar confirmation sound from the system, Asmodeus found himself holding a creature part large cat, part dragon, it was unclear. The little one hopped and ran around its new owner, amusing Asmodeus. Okay, okay, sit, Asmodeus said. The wyvern understood and sat in front of him. Asmodeus decided to understand what kind of creature it was, so he opened the system's description. Nargakuga, a flying wyvern. It is covered in black scales, black fur, and has red eyes, giving it the appearance of a predatory black panther. Its exterior suggests it is primarily a nocturnal hunter. When in rage mode, its eyes glow bright red, leaving a trail of red lines as Nargakuga moves. Additionally, spikes protrude from its tail, which it throws and binds to attacks for devastating strikes. The vertebrae and muscles of its tail are extremely flexible, making Nargakuga's tail agile. Nargakuga's tail is its most powerful weapon. It shakes the scales at the tip of its tail, producing a rattling sound similar to that of a rattlesnake. Female, 20 centimeters in length at the moment. A slowly growing creature, under normal conditions, it should take at least five years to reach maturity, with the potential for evolution. All right, very well. Let's name you Athena, the goddess of wisdom. After all, you're a predator, right? Ding, the pet's name has been successfully registered. System. Show me my current characteristics and hers first. Asmodeus Norin Morningstar. Lineage, Fire Nation bloodline bestowed by spirits to humans, has very high development potential and possibilities for evolution, currently 15% of lineage potential is activated. 1 Combat Power, 25. 2 Health, 100 100. 3 Chi slash Mana slash Internal Energy, 1000 1000. 4 Strength, 19. 5 Agility, 17. 6 Intelligence, 30. Skills and Abilities. World of Avatar Fire Magic, Level 70 100. Fire Nation Combat Technique, Level 87 100. Harry Potter World Magic, Level 1 100. Athena, Wyvern. Lineage, Wyverns, with a very high threshold for peak combat power and potential evolutions, 10% of lineage potential is currently activated. 1 Combat Power, 4. 2 Health, 20 twentieths. 3 Chi slash Mana slash Internal Energy, 75 70 fifths. 4 Strength, 6. 5 Agility, 19. 6 Intelligence, 5. Skills, Tail Strike Maximum Level. Ok, can you show me Dumbledore's characteristics? I had contact with him. Albus Dumbledore. Lineage, Phoenix Lineage. High development potential. Several evolution options are available, currently 40% of lineage potential is activated. 1 combat power, 35. 2 health, 8080. 3 chi slash mana slash internal energy, 800 slash 800. 4 strength, 8. 5 agility, 9. 6 intelligence, 30. Skills and abilities. Magic of the wizarding world, level 90 slash 100. Alchemy, level 75 slash 100. Dueling Mastery, level 98 slash 100. Damn it, said Asmodeus, why do I have more internal energy than the old man but lower combat power? Ding, since the magic of the Avatar world relies on using elements directly and is not as versatile as the local magic, your body and magic are stronger and have a much higher development potential than the locals, but combat power suffers on first stages. Besides that, you're not as strong as you think you are. 25 points of combat power is a lot for this world, but it just means you're not at the bottom. Power scores are increasing exponentially, meaning that the higher the combat power, the harder it is to raise it. Dumbledore's 35 points can actually handle 5 of your kind with 25 points. Also, the host has high attack power but extremely low defense compared to Dumbledore. Alright, fine, I admit, I currently don't have any methods to resist teleportation magic and this strange magic. Chapter 8, Hogwarts Express September 1, 1991, King's Cross Station, 10.20 a.m. Asmodeus stepped out of the taxi Grandmother Anna, had arranged for him and headed toward the station entrance. 
Upon finding the coveted entrance to Platform 9 and 3 fourths, he heard a girl's voice shouting. Mom, Dad, hurry up, we're going to be late for the train. In response, they said, take it easy, dear, your dad is carrying the bags, and besides, I can't see Platform 9 and 3 slash 4. Asmodeus turned around and saw an 11-year-old curly-haired girl, followed by what seemed to be her parents with two suitcases on a trolley. He approached and said, I heard you are looking for platform 9 and 3 fourths, it's right here, pointing to the third column from the ninth platform. The woman, presumably the girl's mother, said, Oh, thank you. Are you a little wizard too? What year are you in? You look older than our Hermione. Asmodeus, having understood who this family was, immediately replied, Yes, I'm also a student at Hogwarts, but like your daughter, I'm a new student. I transferred from another school, as Dumbledore had instructed him to say if asked. Anyway, over the past week, he had read most of the books for the first year. Oh, from another school. I didn't know there were other magical schools, said the middle-aged man. Yes, there aren't many, but there are about a dozen or so scattered around. All right, let's not block the way. Repeat after me, and you, Mr. and Mrs., hold hands with your daughter if you want to get to the other side. Saying this, he turned around and ran toward the column. But the expected collision didn't happen. In front of the family's eyes, he passed through the wall and disappeared. Hermione turned around, looked at her parents, and said, Let's go, taking their hands and leading them through the passage. Hermione's parents hadn't expected their daughter to be so determined, and before the collision, they closed their eyes but feeling no pain, they opened their eyes again, finding themselves feeling as if they had traveled back fifty years. An old red steam train stood at the platform, and conductors were shouting, train departing in thirty minutes, everyone who hasn't taken a seat on the train, board now. Wow, sighed the Grangers and headed towards the train. As they approached, they saw Asmodeus already boarding. Mrs. Granger said, Dear, look at that boy who helped you. You can go with him. Hermione also spotted the boy and decided to sit with him in the same compartment. She thought she could ask about magic and compare her knowledge with his. After finishing loading their luggage onto the train, the Grangers said goodbye to Hermione and waited for the train to depart on a bench at the platform. Meanwhile, Hermione, with two suitcases on wheels, slowly walked along the aisle of the train, looking for the boy she had met at the station. In one of the compartments, Hermione finally found Asmodeus. Opening the compartment, she saw a boy with long black hair falling to his shoulders, leaning on a two-meter staff, and gazing out of the window with his reddish-orange eyes. Beautiful, she whispered and entered the compartment. Hi, can I sit here? My name is Hermione Granger. You helped me and my family find the entrance, she said. Sure, go ahead, it's free. Actually, the compartment was designed for four adult wizards, so even if four young wizards sat here, it wouldn't be too crowded. Seated. Hermione wasn't sure where to start the conversation, so she focused on the enormous staff and asked. What is this? It's definitely not a wand. How can a wand be larger than a wizard? Asmodeus gave a bitter smile and replied, Why not? This is a staff. Ollivander doesn't have a wand that could withstand my magic, so I have to use this. This conversation that ensued continued until the departure of the train. As the train started moving, Hermione quickly stood up and walked to the window. She saw her parents waving her farewell, and her mom holding back tears. Hermione never thought she would leave home at eleven for almost an entire year. Her eyes reddened, but out of pride, she also held back the tears. Waiting for Hermione to calm down, Asmodeus took Athena out of the cage and began petting her. Athena, in turn, purred like a cat, though without wings, she might be mistaken for a large feline. Hermione, now composed, observed this and couldn't identify the creature. So, she asked, what kind of animal is this? I haven't seen it in Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. Well, that's a book for third-year students, she's called all-knowing for a reason. Yes, it's a rare new species, a wyvern. But don't worry, she's completely tamed and won't attack anyone without my consent. Her name is Athena, she's a girl. Be gentle with her, Asmodeus said, handing Athena to Hermione. Holding the little wyvern. Hermione had already forgotten her concerns about leaving home just ten minutes ago. However, now she was thinking about something else. But, Asmodeus, 
the school only allows cats, owls, or toads as pets. Are you sure there won't be any problems? Don't worry, look at her, apart from the wings and beak, she's just a big cat. Actually, Asmodeus had informed Dumbledore about Athena three days ago. He mentioned that after returning to the shelter, he went to the forest to practice magic, and this creature attached itself to him. Dumbledore said it was fine as long as she didn't attack students. All right, Hermione said hesitantly. She thought that rules shouldn't be broken, but since Asmodeus stated it so confidently, she believed nothing bad would happen. Together, they began petting and playing with the poor wyvern. Athena was saved by the fact that they heard a knock on the door and a hesitant voice saying. Um, sorry to bother you. My name is Neville Longbottom, and my toad is missing. Have you seen a toad? Asmodeus opened the sliding door to the compartment and said. Your toad was missing already on the train? Or before that? On the train. I sat with him in the carriage. Then don't worry, he'll come back. How will he come back? Students are allowed to bring three types of pets because, among non-dangerous species, they can sense magical power well and can find their owner by following that magical trace. So go back to your compartment, don't worry, your toad will come back on its own. Oh, okay. Thanks for letting me know. I always lose Trevor and constantly look for him. Now I know he'll come back on his own. Good job, Asmodeus thought to himself as Neville left, and a system notification sounded. Ding, congratulations on completing the first achievement, prevent the first encounter of the Golden Triangle. For completing this achievement, you receive 10 points. You now have a total of 110 points. Carry out tasks to quickly level up the world. Asmodeus sighed, a mosquito is also meat, it worth 10 points, and for the minimal world enhancement, I need 1000 points. If you're so keen on leveling up the world, you better pay me more. But there was no response from the system. Well, whatever, Asmodeus thought, slightly frustrated. Just as he approached to close the compartment door again, he heard an older student walking through the train shouting, We're approaching Hogwarts. Change into your robes and be ready to disembark in half an hour. In fifteen minutes, both Hermione and Asmodeus had changed into wizarding robes and were ready to disembark. Asmodeus wore a regular robe, not the one the system had given. Dumbledore had mentioned that for official events, he should wear a black robe. After a couple of minutes, a group of children stood at the Hogsmeade railway station. Chapter 9, Here I Go Exiting the train and seeing the Hogsmeade station, Asmodeus heard a rough and loud voice saying, First years, first years, gather around me. Senior students, head to the carriages. Hello, Harry. Okay, all first years with me, let's go to the boats. Approaching the boats, Hagrid said, no more than four people in a boat. Sit down. Asmodeus looked at the thoroughly wet boats and decided he had another way to get to school. Approaching Hagrid, he asked, Hagrid, do we have to take the boat? It's dirty and wet. Ha 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 ha, no, not necessarily. Unless you're a senior, by the way, you look like a third year. What are you doing here? I'm a transferred student, so Dumbledore said I need to be at the sorting like everyone else. Then you need to get on the boat. Is there no other way? Only if you can cross the lake on your own, but there are Grindylos and mermaids in the lake, so I won't allow you to swim. No, Hagrid, you didn't understand. If I get to the castle my way, everything will be fine. I think so, there shouldn't be any problems. But I'm curious, how are you going to do it? Ha, watch and learn. Asmodeus took off the robe, leaving only the shirt underneath. He tied his staff to the robe on his back so that it wouldn't hinder his movement. Doing this, fire began to erupt from under his boots and palms. He gradually compressed it until it resembled the thrusters of an Iron Man suit. See you at Hogwarts. Asmodeus shot upward at the speed of a bullet from a gun. The other students, including Hagrid, watched in awe. Hagrid shouted, Stop, it's dangerous. What if you run out of mana and fall into the lake? But Asmodeus, though hearing Hagrid, didn't stop. Ha, I have more mana than Dumbledore, if it runs out from a short flight, I'll feel like an idiot. The students below whispered to each other, wondering if their parents could fly. They discovered that no one present, except for the strange boy who had just flown away, knew anyone who could fly. Hermione, frowning, thought, I must learn to fly and not fall behind him. You might think that Asmodeus is showing off, 
but don't forget about the flying achievement, teach two-thirds of Hogwarts students to fly. Even though students won't be able to fly exactly like him lacking mana and not having the same affinity with fire this demonstration will surely inspire them to attempt to study or create flight magic. That's why Asmodeus decided to showcase his skills. While Asmodeus was flying, Hagrid and the first year students were rowing in boats, Professor McGonagall was heading towards the main entrance. I hope this year Gryffindor will have students who follow the rules, or at least don't roam at night. I hope the girl Granger ends up in Gryffindor, I really liked her. In such contemplation, she reached the main entrance of the castle and opened the door, but what she saw made her lose her previous composure. The full spectrum of emotions played across her face, from shock to anger. What do you think she saw? She saw a human silhouette hurtling toward her like a falling comet. Two minutes ago. Asmodeus realized that due to the darkness and his unfamiliarity with the castle, he didn't know which entrance to fly towards. So, he hovered in the air, trying to identify the entrance he needed. He happened to spot a witch in a green robe and a pointed hat. He immediately recognized her as Professor McGonagall, who must be waiting for first-year students for sorting. Therefore, he directed himself towards her. Throwing his hands behind his back and leaning forward, he descended sharply. After a minute, Asmodeus slowed down and landed gently in front of Professor McGonagall, who already had an undisguised rage on her face. Good evening, he said. Is the sorting taking place here? With gritted teeth, Professor McGonagall replied, Yes, here, young man. Can you explain why you are not with the first year group, and what is your name? I'm Asmodeus Norin Morningstar, and I separated from the group because I didn't want to sit in a dirty boat. And you decided flying was a better option. McGonagall said, restraining her anger. Well, yes, it's faster, and besides, I'm confident in my flying skills. Young man, don't talk to me about confidence. I don't know who allowed you to fly across the lake, but I will inquire with the headmaster about your punishment. But Professor, I haven't done anything wrong. Why punish me? For instilling bad ideas in the younger generation, she said, cutting him off. Asmodeus thought, what bad ideas? What's wrong with flying? But he didn't say anything, it's better to accept it and not argue for now. In any case, he doesn't think Dumbledore will be against it. Nodding he began to wait for the rest of the group to reach the entrance. After 10 to 15 minutes of waiting, McGonagall and Asmodeus noticed the lantern and the half-giant, followed by 30 to 40 first-year students. After a couple more minutes, Hagrid and the first-years were at the entrance. First-years here, Professor McGonagall. I see, Hagrid, but I'm curious why one of them arrived 20 minutes before you. Professor McGonagall, you don't understand. Who would have thought that if I told him he could swim across the lake by himself, he wouldn't need to get in a boat, he'd just fly away. I didn't even get a chance to say anything, and he was already soaring high into the sky. Hagrid said with an aggrieved look, glancing at Asmodeus, who looked away as if it wasn't about him. All right, Hagrid, nothing to worry about. Fortunately, he didn't fall. Complete the sorting ceremony according to the procedure first, and then deal with this matter after the sorting ceremony is over. Professor McGonagall opened her mouth to decide. Many professors at Hogwarts, such as Dumbledore, have been waiting in the Great Hall for a long time. She can't keep all the professors and other senior students waiting to deal with a flying kid. She knows which one is more important. It is good. Hagrid nodded and stepped aside. Well, welcome to Hogwarts. The house will be your home for the next seven years. In a little while, you'll walk through this door and join the rest of the class. But before you get to the dining hall, you need to be assigned a House Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, or Slytherin. Your outstanding performance will give the House extra points, and violations will deduct points. At the end of the year, the House with the highest credits can win the House Cup. Now, let's go to the sorting ceremony with me. After Professor McGonagall turned around, the closed door of the auditorium opened immediately, and the students followed McGonagall into the auditorium. The sky above the Hogwarts Great Hall resembled a bright starry expanse, candles suspended in mid-air. Asmodeus gazed with interest at the enchanted sky. This sky isn't real, it's been enchanted to resemble the night sky, as I read in A History of Hogwarts, explained Hermione, who had appeared by his side at an unknown time. Asmodeus gave Hermione a slight nod. It's not that he was unaware of this from the movies, he was simply once again marveling at the diverse applications of magic in this world. You see, 
Magic in Ong's world during the war was primarily used for battles and warfare. Only earthbenders could employ their abilities for construction. Therefore, witnessing such unique and sophisticated uses of magic in this setting sparked Asmodeus' desire to learn more, extending beyond the development of his combat fire magic. Professor McGonagall asked the young wizards to line up. Some of the other students in the auditorium were chatting, and many wizards were also looking in that direction. Welcome to Hogwarts. Next, we need to determine which house you belong to before you can officially enter. I will call your names, and then please step onto the tall platform in the middle, put on the sorting hat, and it will decide to which house you belong. Asmodeus lined up with the young wizards, gazing at the stage before him, filled with childhood excitement. Hogwarts, here I am. Even though he's over 30 in total, the hormones of a 13-year-old body make him feel like a child again. Especially compared to the world of Avatar, the world of Harry Potter is undoubtedly much more magical and, most importantly, much safer. Although the peak combat power, among humans, is at a similar level, it doesn't manifest in such quantities as in Avatar. Moreover, the wars in this world and the world of Harry Potter are unequal in their cruelty. More than that, the destructive power in the Avatar world is much higher. For comparison, recall the magical wars in the world of Harry Potter and the world of Avatar. In the magical world, there are only 2 to 3 million wizards. In the world of Avatar, the population of the four air temples destroyed and exterminated by the Fire Nation is 40,000, which is more than all the wizards in Britain. These losses are only among airbenders, how many ordinary people were killed is unknown. And the number of magic users in the world of Avatar is much higher than in Harry Potter. In the world of the Four Elements, every third person is a bender, while in the world of Hogwarts, it's every ten thousandth person or even rarer. Don't forget the difference in the population of the worlds, the Harry Potter world is in fact an ordinary world with magic, that is two to three million wizards and another seven billion ordinary people. In the world of Avatar there is no so-called law of secrecy, and the total population is about fifteen to twenty million a third of which are benders. That's why Asmodeus allowed himself to behave childishly. Chapter 10, Sorting High on the platform, the sorting hat suddenly opened, revealing a mouth. Sorting hat sang its song. When the voice of the sorting hat fell silent, the hall erupted in applause. The sorting hat bowed to each of the four houses in turn and finally remained motionless. At that moment, Professor McGonagall took out a piece of parchment and said loudly. Next. Classmates, whom I call, please step onto the platform, put on the sorting hat, sit on the stool, and await sorting. Hannah Abbott Hannah Abbott hurried, put on the hat, and the hat immediately shouted, Hufflepuff. Hufflepuffs applauded loudly, welcoming their first new student. The names continued to be called. Every time the sorting hat shouted the name of a house, that house applauded. Greyfinder was the loudest, and two redheads still hissed when Slytherin was announced. After a few minutes, Asmodeus heard a familiar name. Hermione Granger. Greyfinder. The sorting hat shouted, and the curly-haired girl ran to the Greyfinder table. Sometimes looking around in search of Asmodeus. When Harry's turn came, Asmodeus observed as he mumbled, presumably resisting Slytherin. He had just heard Ron speaking poorly of Slytherin to Harry. After a lengthy exchange of opinions, the sorting hat finally delivered the expected result, Greyfinder. The Greyfinder upperclassmen applauded, chanting, We've got Potter. We've got Potter. As for Mr. Ronald, as soon as the sorting hat touched his hair, he shouted, Another Weasley, Greyfinder. Asmodeus recalled that the entire Weasley family were Greyfinder students. This continued until only one person remained, Asmodeus. As he understood, being older than everyone and Dumbledore registering him as a transferred student, he wasn't called when they called people with surnames starting with the letter M. When his name was called, Asmodeus leisurely stepped forward and gracefully sat on the stool. Hello, Mr. Sorting Hat. He then placed the hat on his head. Ah, fire, fire, everywhere fire. Get me out of here. Flames everywhere. The hat loudly exclaimed throughout the hall, leaped off Asmodeus' head, using its brim as arms to push away and ran towards the professor's table. The hall fell silent. If someone had dropped a needle at that moment, Everyone in the room would have known where and who dropped it. The professors exchanged glances. Dumbledore stood up, lifting the sorting hat. He asked, Can you explain more precisely what happened? The sorting hat replied, Fire, fire everywhere, Albus, in his consciousness, everywhere flames. I was so frightened. 
and his blood, such lineage I have never seen, as if liquid lava flows in his veins. Dumbledore and the professors. Meanwhile, Asmodeus opened his eyes and realized that something was wrong. He asked the system, Hey, what's going on? Why was the sorting hat screaming about fire? Ding, host, your lineage of flame is gifted to you by the lion turtle, and your sea of consciousness looks like fire, so the sorting hat got scared. So, I have a natural protection against legilimency. In a sense, replied the system. What should I do now? I won't be able to pass the sorting like this. Relax your mind and let the hat examine it. If you stay a bit more at ease, it will see the flames again. All right, but won't Sorting Hat see my past lives experiences? No, Sorting Hat is only looking for the Department of Consciousness responsible for your character. Okay. At that moment, the professors and Dumbledore approached with the Sorting Hat in hand. Hello, Asmodeus. Do you know the reason for this mishap? Dumbledore asked, looking at him. Professor, it's probably because of my connection to fire, but I have an idea on how to solve this problem. Oh, and how is that? Dumbledore playfully inquired. I need to completely relax my mind and let the hat examine my character. Oh, let's try it. We can't leave you without sorting, Dumbledore said, placing the hat on Asmodeus's head. Asmodeus sighed and tried to relax his mind as much as possible, allowing the sorting hat in. Hmm, very challenging, very challenging. You're very brave, like a Gryffindor, and as reliable as a Hufflepuff. Besides, your ambitions know no bounds, and you're ready to use all means to achieve your goals. But it's strange that your thirst for knowledge and these ambitions are intertwined. In other words, your ambitions include both the desire for knowledge and power. If I were to liken you to an animal, you wouldn't fit any of the house emblems, you are more like a covetous dragon, thirsting for wealth, knowledge, and power. Complicated, very complicated. This time, the sorting hat spoke aloud, and the entire hall, including the professors, could hear. Students and teachers, already shocked by the hat's previous actions, now felt a sour taste in their mouths. Why does he possess qualities from all houses while I only have one or two? The children thought to themselves. Meanwhile, the professors critically examined Asmodeus, waiting for the sorting to conclude. I've made up my mind, dear. You will go to Ravenclaw. The hat exclaimed. All Ravenclaw students and Professor Flitwick jumped from their seats and applauded loudly. While students and heads of other houses looked at them with envy. Chapter 11, Reactions on All Sides After the minor incident, students quickly forgot about what had happened because the food on the table was much more important. Having eaten and headed to the Ravenclaw Tower accompanied by Prefect, Asmodeus had no idea of that how many people would struggle to sleep that night because of him. While Asmodeus took a shower and prepared for bed, in the headmaster's office, all the deans and professors of Hogwarts were present except for Quirrell. In the headmaster's office. Dumbledore, why did you call us? Let me rejoice in my new student, said Phileas Flitwick. To discuss Mr. Morningstar, Dumbledore replied. What's there to discuss? His potential and what the sorting hat said. What's so special about that? Surely there have been geniuses in the entire history of Hogwarts. The sorting hat intervened. There haven't been any. His potential is limitless. If I were to compare him with the founders, they wouldn't even come close. If you were to combine all the founders into one person, they might equal him. Frankly, if I were told to choose a successor to Hogwarts, there would be no one more suitable than him in the entire history. But do not dare to plot against him. This is the will of the founders embedded in me. He must fulfill his potential, he is the future of the magical world. The sorting hat spoke and fell silent again. That's what I'm talking about. We must ensure he has a healthy childhood and prevent him from becoming the third Dark Lord, Dumbledore said. Hearing this, the professors who had just been actively arguing fell silent. Hey, it's too much to compare him to a Dark Lord. Dumbledore, you're too wary. He's not like Tom. He's already made friends with a muggle-born witch, Flitwick said. Yeah, he's not Tom. He reminds me of someone else, my old friend, Grindelwald. Hearing this, all the professors exhaled cold air. Why do you think that, Albus? McGonagall asked. His gaze and behavior. Although he treats everyone amicably, I always feel like he looks at others as if an adult is looking at children playing in the sandbox. Hearing this, 
none of the professors dared to refute it, as they, also, had observed Asmodeus during dinner. Although he was friendly with everyone during the meal, actively engaging with his classmates from Ravenclaw, the seasoned professors saw in his gaze not an attitude of equality but rather a look towards those who needed protection and assistance. Asmodeus seemed not to perceive any of the children as peers. Despite the care and friendliness in his gaze, there was something else, something only Dumbledore could understand, as he shared a similar perspective. But right now, it's just arrogance. He hasn't done anything wrong. Why should we be wary of him? Because both Grindelwald and Voldemort were once like him. Believe me, I know what I'm talking about, though I'm not claiming he'll become one of them. I liked him a lot upon our first meeting, and I don't want him to repeat my mistakes, Dumbledore said. The professors hadn't had a chance to add anything when they heard the sound of something falling to the floor. Turning around, they saw Professor Trelawney, the divination professor, lying on the floor as if she had had a seizure. When Minerva tried to rush over and help her colleague, Dumbledore stopped her and said, Wait, she's prophesying. Dumbledore didn't finish his sentence before everyone heard Trelawney's voice speaking prophecy. Child of Flame, the magical world and the world of muggles, uniting, the future, his will, darkness or light, who will prevail, depends, on him. Having finished the unconscious prophecy, Professor Trelawney lost consciousness. Dumbledore approached to check on her condition and, exhaling with relief, said, she's fine, just mental strain. Gully. He called, and a house elf appeared in the office. I'm here, director. Go take Professor Trelawney to the school infirmary, tell Pomfrey she needs rest and quiet. Yes, director, replied the house elf, and disappeared with Trelawney. Seeing the house elf gone, everyone remained silent. Although not entirely clear, they heard most of Trelawney's prophecy. What they heard left them bewildered. The magical world and the muggle world are going to be united, and whether it leans towards darkness or light depends on the choice of the child. Although the professors didn't really understand the part about darkness and light, Dumbledore understood it well, he knew Voldemort was not truly dead and awaited a chance to return. Asmodeus nor in Morningstar's decision would determine the victory or defeat, be it Harry Potter or Voldemort. Dumbledore, taking away the tingling in his temples and removing his glasses, said, Please keep what happened in the office today a secret. If the wrong people hear this prophecy, you can imagine what might happen. This time, none of the professors argued. All right, I don't want such pressure on my student from the first day at school. I don't care, added Snape. I'll try to guide him on the right path, said McGonagall. We must protect this child, Pomona said. Okay, you may go. Sorry for summoning you in the middle of the night, Dumbledore tiredly said. Alone in the office, Albus looked at Fox and asked, What do you think, my old friend? Fox chirped in response. Ha, you like him because he, too, is close to the flame, Dumbledore chuckled bitterly, unaware that Trelawney wasn't the only one who prophesied tonight. Dash. Austria, Nurmengard Castle. The old man sat on the floor, tears were streaming from his eyes, tears of joy. He laughed and shouted, Yes, here it is, a chance. A future where the magical world is not destroyed. I was wrong, wizards have a chance. The cries of joy and happiness lasted for about half an hour until the old man calmed down. Speaking aloud, he said, I need to help him, provide him protection. He is our only chance. I won't let him suffer. Saying this, he approached the window, raised his hand to the sky, and from his index finger shot an emblem of saints into the sky. Forgive me, my friend, I violated our agreement but I see hope again, the hope of wizards. I must help him. Having said this into the void, he operated and disappeared from the castle where he had lived for almost sixty years. When he vanished, an alarm sounded in the German Ministry of Magic, and an employee ran towards the office of the Minister of Magic. Knock knock knock. Enter. Minister, it's urgent. Grindelwald has escaped. What? How is that possible? Why did he decide to leave? What are we going to do now? While the minister was in panic, he didn't notice the spark of happiness in the eyes of the subordinate who brought the message. Dash. In different pure-blood wizarding families, there was also unrest as their children from Hogwarts sent letters home, describing everything that happened at the induction ceremony. Malfoy family ancestral home. Damn it, I knew there was something wrong with this child. Dumbledore wouldn't personally lead new students to Diagon Alley without reason. 
They needed to convene the 28 families, except for the accursed traitors, the Weasleys, and decide on their next course of action, he thought. Malfoy took a piece of paper and wrote an invitation to a meeting for all pure-blood families. He then took out his wand and cast the duplicating spell, Gemino. Handing the letters to the owl, he said, Fly, send these letters to pure-blood families, excluding the Weasleys. Chapter 12, The First Lesson Asmodeus awoke to the melodic chime of the notification system. Ding, congratulations to the host for completing the task, enroll in Hogwarts, 20 points obtained. Ding, congratulations to the host for achieving Ravenclaw, 15 points earned. Ding, congratulations to the host for accomplishing the achievement first night at Hogwarts, 5 points received. At this moment, the host has 150 points. Would you like to open a trading center? No. Nevertheless, Asmodeus currently lacks a sense of crisis and is accumulating points for the purchase of a guide for training magical knights, including a set of meditation techniques for mana accumulation and a scheme for creating magical rings around the heart. He believes that passive income from raising the world level and increasing the average combat power is much more convenient and profitable than picking Voldemort's nose or pulling Dumbledore's beard. As the Ministry of Magic in Germany has not yet announced Grindelwald's escape, and Asmodeus is unaware of the movements of pure blood forces, he prepared for his first lesson. While Greyfinder and Slytherin begin the year with Transfiguration, Ravenclaw starts with a Charms class. The first spell lesson of the school year involves a small badger from Hufflepuff. But for Asmodeus, this course of study seems tasteless, and it's a pity to abandon it. It's dull because the current magic lessons cover first-year knowledge, mostly theoretical and foundational. For Asmodeus, who has reread books from the first three years over the summer, it's a waste of time. Fortunately, Professor Flitwick, during his lecture, shares some magical insights and pronunciation skills, something Asmodeus cannot afford to miss. Blame it on his wand being more of a staff, making every spell he uses look like a cheap additional fire animation kids buy in mobile games. For instance, when Professor Flitwick was teaching levitation charm Wingardium Leviosa, he urged young wizards to pay attention to wand movements. First, swish, then flick, that's the standard gesture for casting this spell. But just as Professor Flitwick asked students in the class to practice, Asmodeus suddenly raised his hand and asked, Professor, is this action fixed, or can it be anything? Saying this, he pulled out a staff from behind and, ignoring the strange looks from classmates, slightly tapped it on the floor. Everyone saw the feather in front of him slowly rise into the air, with occasional tongues of flame appearing around it, small, beautiful, and incomprehensible to the students. Although Professor Flitwick was already aware of Asmodeus's affinity for fire, he was still shocked to see that even using the basic levitation spell Asmodeus created small flames around the target. They didn't harm the object, instead, they formed an incomplete cone around the feather, as if protecting it. While Professor Flitwick was stunned, Asmodeus repeated the question about whether the action was fixed during spellcasting or not. Flitwick already knew why the young wizard asked such a question, seeing the staff, so he gave a detailed answer. No. No. Certainly not. Professor Flitwick shook his head and said, However, Mr. Morningstar, you've asked a question that no student has ever asked, at least not when I was a professor at Hogwarts. Slightly raising the wand in his hand, the book next to him levitated. The answer to this question is a bit long, but I can still tell you. In reality, the movements for casting any spell are not fixed. Once, I was talking to Miranda Gusakl. When she started writing standard spells, she observed many young people. Wizards, just like all of you here. She found that when these young wizards began studying levitation charm Wingardium Leviosa, they habitually used swish and flick motions without any guidance. Of course, some people would be different, but the majority would do just that. Later, after extensive research, Mrs. Gorshak discovered that each magical spell corresponds to a specific action. This insight can facilitate young wizards, unfamiliar with magic, in mastering and studying various magical spells. Based on this, Mrs. Gusakl compiled actions for casting spells for each commonly used spell and finally wrote a series of books, Standard Spells. Professor, if casting spells is just an auxiliary means of learning magic, what is the key to studying magic? Asmodeus continued to inquire. It's willpower, Mr. Morningstar, it's willpower. Professor Flitwick scratched his chest with the hand holding the wand, and a ripple of memories flashed in his eyes. You'll find that magic is the key for every wizard. It reflects one's actions in reality. 
If a person has a kind heart and good intentions, they can easily learn healing magic. But if their heart is evil, and they sincerely intend to harm, they'll find it easier to learn magic that harms people. To be honest, Mr. Morningstar, you've surprised me a lot. No little wizard has ever thought about this. 10 points to Ravenclaw. Thus, earning 10 points for his house, Asmodeus confirmed his speculation about magic in the world of Harry Potter. By comparison, magic in the Avatar world relies on controlling the elements, roughly speaking, physical particles in space. It is somewhat akin to the magic in the world of the Sorcerer's Apprentice, where magic is essentially advanced physics. Although the caster's strong emotions will also affect the effectiveness of the spell. For example, firebenders primarily use rage as a catalyst for magic. Zuko even once lost the ability to use magic due to being depressed and losing his purpose. But, no matter how strongly emotions influence benders in the world of Avatar, their influence is not as big as in the world of Harry Potter. The magic in the world of Harry Potter is more idealistic, it operates on the principle of the Green Lantern Ring from DC Comics. Although this comparison is very rough, since Green Lanterns use the emotional spectrum as energy, while wizards use emotions to control magical energy. Something like, I want this to happen, and it will. It lacks almost any scientific rationale. As long as the spellcaster's will is strong enough, and they clearly know the effect they want to achieve, casting the spell is extremely simple. Unfortunately or fortunately, this level of willpower is developed over time, and young wizards cannot use Avada Kedavra wherever they please. By the way, this explains why Voldemort always shouts Avada Kedavra loudly. Firstly, it increases the fear of opponents and weakens their will, and secondly, it helps strengthen his own will and envision the effect the spell is supposed to achieve. Soon, it was time for lunch. After classes, Asmodeus returned to Ravenclaw's common room, copied the class schedule posted on the wall using copy in double, and then went to the Great Hall to eat. At this time, his cheeks were puffed, one hand held the class schedule, and the other stuffed food into his mouth. He was unaware that Dumbledore was absent from the professor's seat. Chapter 13, The Element While Asmodeus was indulging in his feast, Dumbledore, who had spent the night constantly operating towards Germany, finally reached his destination. Entrance to the German Ministry of Magic Dumbledore was awaited by Minister Schmidt and the entire top echelon of executive power. Director Dumbledore, thank goodness you're here, said Minister Schmidt, who appeared well over 80, approaching and embracing Dumbledore warmly. In contrast to the ineffectual English Minister Fudge, who only cared about his own power, Minister Schmidt was an aura who had fought on the front lines against the fanatics commanded by Grindelwald. He genuinely understood and respected the fight for one's country, not just a thirst for power, and he wasn't going to ignore a problem just because it might harm his approval ratings, unlike Fudge. Moreover, he knew and respected Dumbledore's power. He had witnessed the legendary duel against Grindelwald and understood that even if the entire German Ministry of Magic gathered to attack Dumbledore or Grindelwald, they wouldn't leave a scratch on them. So, after the friendly embrace, although, in Dumbledore's case, it might have a different undertone, Schmidt stepped back and said, We've been waiting for you, Director Dumbledore. An hour after Grindelwald's disappearance, this letter appeared at the castle gate. With that, he pulled a letter from his pocket, which read, Greetings, my old friend. How have you been all these years? Did you miss me? Well, never mind that, let's get straight to business. I'll be waiting for you at the address XXXX at 6 p.m. on the 3rd of September. Come, we have much to discuss. Seeing this note, Dumbledore's pupils narrowed, and he said, I'll go alone, evidently, he wants to negotiate something. But, Director, isn't that dangerous? No, besides, if there is danger, you would be a burden. Dumbledore didn't mince his words, it wasn't the time for that. Well, until the meeting with Grindelwald, there's still a whole day, and this old man needs to rest. Do you have a place to stay? Of course, you're always an honored and welcome guest in Germany. The next morning, Asmodeus woke up and checked the tasks and achievements offered by the system. Shock Snape with your knowledge of potion making, reward 15 points. Pet the old lady cat, 50 points, semi-legendary achievement. Listen to the cry of a young mandrake for two minutes without using magic and without losing consciousness, reward 20 points. Well, let's rule out the third one, I'm not a masochist, thought Asmodeus. Both of the first two are quite achievable, but the second one is a bit dangerous. Anyway. So, after washing up, 
he headed to the dining hall for breakfast. While he was eating, someone patted him on the shoulder and with a familiar but displeased voice said, Why are you ignoring me? To his right appeared a curly-haired girl with a disdainful expression. When did I ignore you? Yesterday, you never came up to me. Why should I come to you? Because we're friends. All right, but yesterday after dinner, I went straight back to my room, and during lunch, I was memorizing the class schedule, so I didn't have time to chat. Besides, haven't you made new friends in Greyfinder? Well, there's Neville, two idiots, and my roommates, but I've known you longer, she muttered quietly. Due to Asmodeus' intervention, Hermione didn't get acquainted with the rest of the Golden Trio on the train. Eventually, they did meet, but they didn't become friends as quickly as in the original. As Asmodeus was the first classmate she met in the magical world, she naturally wanted to maintain a connection. Asmodeus wasn't against talking to Hermione, he didn't really like solitude. It's just that he found it challenging to communicate with kids on an equal footing. Where will you be during the lunch break? I don't know yet. Probably. I'll grab a bite and go to the library. All right, we agreed. We'll meet in the library. Okay, Hermione nodded and went back to the Greyfinder table. All right, what's next for us? Transfiguration and a lesson with the elderly cat professor. He thought, standing up from the table and heading towards the exit of the dining hall. At the Greyfinder table, a conversation was taking place. Hermione, do you know him? Yes, we met on the train. Cool. What's cool about it? Don't you know he made a feather levitate during the charms class, and there was a fire cocoon around him? No, how did he do that? I don't know. I thought you knew. Hermione didn't reply but pondered. Remembering what the sorting hat said, fire, fire everywhere. She decided to ask Professor McGonagall why her and Asmodeus spells differed. She looked towards the professor's table and saw McGonagall and Flitwick finishing their meals getting ready to leave the dining hall. She stood up and walked towards them. Professor McGonagall, Professor Flitwick, please wait. Oh, Miss Granger, what happened? McGonagall asked with doubt on her face. Professor McGonagall, I heard that during the charms class, Asmodeus levitation spell was different from ours. Ah, the girl is talking about the fire that appeared around the feather. Yes, I want to know why it happened. All right, let me explain to you. Do you mind, Professor McGonagall? Flitwick said. Yes, I'm also curious to hear your explanation. Well, Miss Granger, what do you know about mana or magical energy? We use it to cast spells. Correct, but not only that. You already know that the more mana a wizard has, the more spells they can cast without getting tired, and the stronger the spell will be. But what do you know about the elements of this magical energy? Nothing. Hermione said a bit dejectedly. Haha, don't worry about not knowing about the elements. In fact, 99% of all wizards have never thought about it, and they don't need to. So, almost all wizards in the world have magic of a neutral element or no element. Yours, mine, Professor McGonagall's, and all the little wizards in the hall, our mana doesn't have a specific element, so to speak, no color. If it were a color, it wouldn't even be white it would be more like transparent or colorless. Understand? Kind of, Hermione replied. So, Mr. Morningstar is different from us. His magic has an element and a color. His element is fire, and his magic is red because he has a very high affinity with the fire element. So, when casting spells, it can cause an unexpected reaction, like in the case of the levitation spell Wingardium Leviosa. Since Miranda Goshawk wrote standard spells based on data from ordinary children wizards with neutral magic and didn't adjust spells for people with elements. Doesn't that mean he has to learn spells differently? In a sense, yes. People with elements are generally very gifted, and they don't have problems optimizing spells for themselves. Do you have any other acquaintances with an element? Hermione asked in surprise. You also have, Miss Granger. Headmaster Dumbledore, he also has an affinity with fire though not as strong as Mr. Norrin, but he's also very close to the fire element. Why do they have an element, and others don't? I can't say for sure, but it's likely influenced by their lineage. For example, the Dumbledore family is known for having a phoenix come to their aid when they are in trouble. But doesn't that confirm the theory of pure bloods? No, no, not at all, Miss Granger. Miss Granger, honestly, 
none of the so-called 28 pure blood families have any special blood or element. And the term 28 pure blood families was introduced in 1930 by an idiot named Cantankerous Knot. Never be ashamed of your blood, in fact, any wizard of Muggle origin had a wizard ancestor at some point. Although we don't know who was the first wizard, we can almost certainly say that all wizards share common roots. Most likely, there was a group of the first wizards, and we are their very distant descendants. Then is there a way to acquire an element? I'm sorry, Miss Granger, I don't know. Then can you tell me who else can be considered people with elements? Well, actually, most of them became great individuals, as I mentioned earlier, our director and the immortal Nicholas Flamel. Wait, who is Nicholas Flamel? You can look it up in the library, I think you'll find it interesting, said Flitwick with a smile. Okay, is there anyone else? Well, I don't really want to talk about the others. Please, Professor Flitwick, I'm very interested. All right, then. Gellert Grindelwald and the one you can't name, both have truly special lineages. What kind? Gellert Grindelwald and Nicholas Flamel have the gift of prophecy, which is also a special blood, and the color of their magic is more dark blue than non-colored like ours. Ah, the one you mentioned third. Um, well, he's a very bad person. He has blood that allows him to speak with snakes, but I don't know exactly the color of his magical energy, although I have a guess that it's going to be green or black. All right, thank you. Thoughtfully, Hermione said her thanks and left. Professor Flitwick, you shouldn't have told her that. She has a very strong spirit of rivalry, I'm afraid Miss Granger will compare herself to Mr. Noren. Minerva, I think she would have found this in books anyway. She has a thirst for knowledge albeit not as strong as in Ravenclaw, but still. I hope so, said McGonagall. Chapter 14, The Aging Kitten Girl Approaching the Transfiguration class, Asmodeus began to prepare himself mentally. I need to make it look like I have no idea who the professor is. Well, here I am. Entering the class, he glanced around and saw two or three Ravenclaw students who had already taken their seats, along with a cat sitting on the professor's desk. As Asmodeus spotted the cat, his eyes sparkled. Professor McGonagall, completely unaware, suddenly felt a chill in her lower back and opened her eyes. She witnessed Asmodeus flying towards her, using flames, arms outstretched to grab her. The cat jumped, attempting to evade with hisses and yells, but to her immense dismay and joy, Asmodeus caught her. With an iron grip, he held the kitty, stroking its head with an indifferent expression as he sat at a desk. Professor McGonagall felt as if all the malice in the world was directed at her, wondering why this child was so powerful. Watching her futile attempts to escape, Asmodeus merely smirked, thinking, Ha, 19, strength points are no joke. Although I'm weakened compared to my adult self, I'm still much stronger than the people in this world. As Asmodeus contemplated, he felt movement in his right pocket, where he had cast a traceless stretching spell. Tilting his head, he saw Athena's little head, zero peering out, looking surprised as her beloved owner handled another cat. Hiss, she hissed at Professor McGonagall. The professor, in turn, puffed her tail and hissed back in feline fashion. However, Professor McGonagall was unaware that despite Athena's cat-like appearance, she was no ordinary cat. Therefore, when her hiss was met with a dragon's roar, she was slightly stunned. Fortunately, Athena hadn't fully emerged from the pocket when Asmodeus released the kitten girl, taking her into his arms. In any case, he had already earned his 50 points for the task. Quiet, Athena, this is the professor's cat. Don't mistreat her, Asmodeus whispered. The wyvern responded with a low growl. I know you're jealous, but don't worry. Tonight I'll find Professor Dumbledore to ask him to openly allow me to take you out of the room. For now, crawl back in, the lesson is about to begin, Asmodeus said, patting Athena's head. While he pacified his dragon cat, Another cat exited the classroom, finding a dark corner in an empty room nearby and transformed back into a human. Damn it, Mr. Morningstar, how dare you? It's a good thing there were only a few people in the office, and apparently, none of them knows I'm an animagus. I need to get rid of this habit. If students find out about what happened. In reality, the Ravenclaw students had known who it was all along, but they decided to forget about it and never bring it up again. Besides, it was only fitting to say a prayer for Asmodeus, even if his last name was that of the devil. So, five minutes later, as all the first-year students gathered in the Transfiguration class, 
a minute before the lesson began, Professor McGonagall entered with a stoic expression. No one, except for four students and a wyvern, knew about her recent embarrassment. Good morning, class. Transfiguration is a strict and dangerous lesson. Anyone who dares to misbehave in my class will feel regret. The lesson officially begins now. Professor McGonagall looked at Asmodeus, tapped her wand on the table, and the table instantly transformed into a live lion, roaring deafeningly at him. Asmodeus, with a twitching face, looked at this and thought, I just petted a cat, so what if it was the professor? She should think I don't know about Animagus. Why do I feel like Professor McGonagall wants to eat me? After teaching theoretical knowledge, Professor McGonagall gave each first-year student a matchstick and asked them to try turning it into a needle. Everyone worked diligently, but there were no signs of success. Asmodeus took out his staff and attempted to transfigure the matchstick. Tapping the wand around the matchstick created flames, and a second later, a beautiful obsidian black needle adorned with the emblem of the Fire Nation lay before him. He was about to set the needle aside and try something more challenging when the keen-eyed Professor McGonagall noticed it. She took it and examined it closely. Very impressive, this is the most perfected transfiguration needle I've ever seen from a first-year student, plus ten for Ravenclaw. Come and take a look at Mr. Morningstar's transfiguration needle. Professor McGonagall is pleased to have a student with outstanding transfiguration talent. Could Mr. Morningstar give this to me? I'll add it to my collection. Asmodeus despite playing with the cat, did so only because of the system's task. He sincerely respected this impartial and stern Gryffindor professor, stood up, and nodded slightly, with pleasure, Professor McGonagall. Ding, achievement unlocked, receive praise from Professor McGonagall, reward 5 points. Current balance, 205 points. The system notification sounded. Ding, the system adapts to the host's circumstances and issues a task earn 100 points for Ravenclaw House, reward 50 points. Inspired by Asmodeus, everyone trained more seriously, and he assisted. After all, transfiguration is not a magical spell. If you pronounce it correctly, you will succeed. Practice is needed here. The rest of the class struggled to transfigure matchsticks into needles during the lesson, but only some of the eaglets managed to make the matchstick look needle-like with Asmodeus's help and advice. However, no one could change the texture and material of the matchstick. After the lessons, Ravenclaw students became closer to Asmodeus. Ravenclaw admired his knowledge. Asmodeus was ready to share his ideas. As talented as Asmodeus was in spells, his flawless performance had initially distanced other first-year students from him. Now, as he decided to help them learn, the relationships between him and his classmates began to improve. After lunch, walking down the corridor toward the library, Asmodeus contemplated how to showcase his knowledge of potions during the evening potions class. I think I'll get the opportunity. If not, I'll go find trouble with Slytherins, then he'll surely try to retaliate. That's when I'll show him what it means to memorize all the potion books for the first four years. During the day, he was in the library with Hermione, discussing charms. Somehow, he had already absorbed all the knowledge from the first to the third class. At four o'clock, Professor Snape, in his black cloak, hurried into the classroom. He stepped forward, the wind blew under his feet, the hem of his cloak fluttering in the wind behind him. It's a pity that the beautiful middle-aged man's hair is shiny and greasy because he hasn't washed it all year round. Asmodeus had seen the professor behind the teacher's desk before, but every time he saw him, he was dressed in this outfit. He had some doubts that the professor didn't even wash his clothes but bathed every day to solve the hygiene problem. Or maybe all his clothes looked like that. You are here to study the exact science and strict art of potion making. Since there is no silly wand here, many of you won't believe its magic. I don't expect you to truly understand the beauty of a boiling cauldron with white smoke and bursts of aroma, a liquid that boils and bubbles, that's what I consider more magical than magic. I can teach you how to enhance your prestige, brew honor, and even prevent death, but under one condition, you must not be one of those idiots I have to deal with. Given Snape's unique tone, no matter how many times he heard it, Asmodeus considered it strange. It sounded as if a person sitting on the toilet is trying to look serious. Snape stepped onto the platform with a blank face, silenced, and looked at the students present. Until he found Asmodeus's figure. He stared at Asmodeus with a scrutinizing gaze for a few seconds. Turning away, he pulled out a scroll and began checking the presence of all students. Snape's voice was low and indifferent, he spoke slowly 
as if nothing could cause fluctuations in his mood. But that sounds a bit ironic. Finally, he read a name that caught his interest. Oh, yes. Snape paused. Asmodeus Norin Morningstar, I've heard about your talent in charms and transfiguration, I hope you won't disappoint me. When it was time for practical work, Snape asked to pair up and prepare an itch relief potion. Asmodeus joined Terry Boot, who lived with him in the same room, although they couldn't be called friends, they were somewhat acquainted. He decisively moved away from Hufflepuff's tables as far as possible. Who knows, maybe there's a hidden genius for explosions in Hufflepuff like a male version of Megaman, Seamus Finnegan, or a slightly clumsy Neville. He decided not to take risks. Even without practice but with a huge reserve of theory, Asmodeus and Terry managed to finish the potion twenty minutes before the others. Professor Snape, we're done. Hmm, only if I say the potion passed inspection, you'll be free. Snape said, approaching the cauldron. But when Snape approached, he paused and, looking at the cauldron, said, Did you change the recipe? Yes, instead of grating the horn slug, I decided to extract from it and add it to the potion in smaller proportions, this way, it will be more effective. We'll check that now. Snape turned around, took the Furunculus potion, and smeared it on his hand. Blisters covered his palm, but he didn't even bat an eye. He took a ladle, scooped up the dark blue potion, and poured it on his hand. Within a second, all the boils and pimples began to heal instantly. Fifteen percent more effective than my recipe, he muttered. How did you come up with this? From Muggle Chemistry. I decided to give it a try, and it worked. Twenty points to Ravenclaw. Snape quietly said and went on to scare the students. But Asmodeus knew that what's on the surface, not to mention in Snape's head, is not always what it seems. Ding, congratulations on completing the task, amaze Snape with your knowledge of potion making, awarded 15 points. Congratulations, host, the current balance, 220 points. Having finished the potions class early, Asmodeus headed towards the common room, he and Hermione agreed to meet there. Chapter 15, Grindelwald, I Saw Hope on September 3rd, at 6 p.m., while Asmodeus was having dinner, Dumbledore had already gone to the address left in the note from Grindelwald. Dumbledore knocks on the door of a house by the Baltic Sea in the city of Puttgarden. Knock, knock, knock. The door, surprisingly, wasn't locked and opened upon knocking. In the lamplight, Dumbledore saw his old friend sitting at the table, oddly not much aged since their last meeting. You've aged, Grindelwald remarked. And you? on the contrary, have kept yourself quite well. Oh, nothing too complicated, a bit of dark magic and transfiguration here and there. Grindelwald replied casually. We need to talk seriously, Gellert. I wanted to say the same. Why did you leave? You promised not to meddle in the wizarding world anymore and to stay in Nurmengard. Calm down, Albus, I left because of your student. Harry Potter. What? Who's that? Dumbledore even coughed at this response. Albus, you know who I'm talking about the child with the gift of fire. Though I don't know his name yet, I've seen his appearance, and my people at Hogwarts will soon contact him. Call off your people. He's at Hogwarts, and his name is Asmodeus Norin Morningstar. Asmodeus Norin Morningstar, Grindelwald slowly pronounced the name, savoring it as if trying a fine wine. Gellert, why do you need him? He's not needed for me, Albus. He's needed for all of us, for the world. Hearing this and aligning it with the Trelawney prophecy, Dumbledore stopped pretending and firmly said, What have you seen? Hope, Albus, hope. Hope for wizards, and even muggles. Hearing the part about muggles, Dumbledore took a cold breath and asked, Tell me everything you've seen. A world where people are no longer divided into wizards and muggles, a world where magic is everywhere. A world where everything depends on your talents and diligence. Magic developed to the point where we can travel through worlds and planets. A world without death, Albus. I saw Ariana alive, and your parents alive. Can you imagine what a beautiful future it is? The more Grindelwald spoke, the more excited he became. He wasn't sitting anymore, he stood, describing the future as he did back in Paris, but this time, he spoke not of the threat to muggles but of a solution, of the future. Dumbledore didn't know what to say after the first few lines. But when he heard about Ariana, he stood up, grabbed Grindelwald by the collar, and through tears asked, Are you telling the truth? Yes, Albus, 
I don't lie. Look at the future with your own eyes. Grindelwald approached his favorite skull-shaped hookah on the table. He took a drag and exhaled. Dumbledore couldn't contain his emotions anymore, watching the future that Grindelwald revealed. Prosperity for wizards, the advancement of magic, the popularity of alchemy, breaking the secrecy law. Wizards living fully in the sunlight. Muggles using magic. He also saw many people who should be dead, walking the streets as if nothing happened. The Potter family reunited, Severus found himself a wife, and they had a daughter. Nicholas Flamel young again. And most importantly, he saw himself young, with his family, Ariana, Aurelius, and Aberforth. Seeing this future, Dumbledore cried tears of joy. This was the world as he wished to see it, a world without unnecessary tragedies. Wiping away tears, Dumbledore turned to Grindelwald and said, But what about your hatred for muggles? Can you allow them to learn magic? Albus, my ideas stemmed from fear, from hatred. What is there to hate in that future? I want that world more than you do because I fought to the end, unlike you. Then what should we do? How can we help him? I'm already gathering my old followers. I need you to arrange a meeting with him. I want to show him this and help him achieve it. Are you with me? Or not? Of course, I'm with you. But first, we need to legalize your current status. You know, when you left the German Ministry of Magic, panic had already begun. Don't worry about that. If you can bring the Minister of Magic of Germany here, I think we can come to an agreement, and he'll agree with me that such a world is worth striving for. Besides, 40% of the ministry consists of my devotees' children. So, even if he disagrees, I can take over the ministry without any fuss and settle everything quietly. No, I don't want more senseless bloodshed. I want to talk to him. Give me an hour, and I'll bring him here. Okay, I'll be here. I'm still considered a criminal who escaped from prison. Dumbledore nodded and left the house, attempting to calm his emotions. In his heart, he vowed not to stop at anything to achieve the predicted future. Ministry of Magic in Germany, 1915 With a bang, Dumbledore appeared before the minister's desk, holding on to Fox. Mr. Schmidt, I need to talk to you. Five minutes later. Director Dumbledore, have you gone mad? It's impossible. I won't release such a dangerous criminal to roam freely. Calm down, Wolfgang, we're talking about something bigger. What could be more significant, Albus? What's more important than releasing the person who caused the first wizarding war? What if I told you he has a way to allow wizards to live openly, without hiding, and without bloodshed? Minister Schmidt, underscore, degree degree. Help, help, Dumbledore has lost his mind. Dumbledore. Calm down. Wolfgang, Dumbledore said, attempting to approach. Stay away from me, keep your distance. Dumbledore. All right, I don't have time to persuade you. You're coming with me. Wait, no, wait, help. No need to shout, I've long ago blocked sounds in the office. W, degree O degree, W. All right, you have nowhere to run. Hold on to me tightly if you don't want to lose a piece of yourself along the way said Dumbledore, gripping the minister's shoulder. Fox. With a puff, the minister and Dumbledore disappeared in the flames of the phoenix. Dumbledore was unaware that behind the wardrobe was the young lover of the minister not that he couldn't notice, but rather chose not to. Underscore. Thirty seconds later. Puff. Let me go, Dumbledore, you've gone mad. Grindelwald watching this and smoking his hookah, zero. Dot, why? Seeing Grindelwald, the minister froze. Oh. Dumbledore, O oh underscore, underscore. Minister, degree dash degree, degree degree. Well, minister, don't worry so much. Your face looks like I'm about to eat you. What if I do worry? You and Dumbledore are together again. How do I know what you're planning? Calm down, Wolfgang. I've already told you. Listen to what he wants to say. Well, I don't have much choice. So let's hear what are you talking about, degree underscore degree, said the minister, sitting on the chair Dumbledore offered him. Half an hour passed. So, you two are telling me there's a child who can make muggles use magic and expose the magical world. Underscore. Yes. Dumbledore and Grindelwald. Minister. All right, let's assume that's true. What do you propose we do next? Help him. 
that's obvious. How to help? As I understand, Dumbledore has known him for no more than a month, and you're a hardened criminal who learned about him from a prophecy. Grindelwald, I sense the world's malice. Ahem, Dumbledore cleared his throat and said, Wolfgang, that's why we want you to help us. Grindelwald needs the opportunity to meet him without hiding and understand what assistance he will need. He wants to involve the saints to help this future come true. Saints. Albus, they're all hardened criminals. I disagree here. They are just, like me, revolutionaries who have suffered failure, similar to Muggle Decembrists. Minister, Zero. After several hours of persuasion and then several more hours of negotiations on the conditions under which Grindelwald can legally leave prison, they came to a conclusion. Let's summarize. Grindelwald undertakes not to harm the Ministry of Magic of Germany and do not attack people who previously interfered with his plans, etc. He will be on probation under the supervision of Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore while in Germany. If no violations of the agreements are observed within a year, surveillance of Gellert Grindelwald during his stay in Germany will be lifted. Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore undertakes to restrain Gellert Grindelwald from aggressive actions towards Germany and its inhabitants, and in the event of a violation of the agreement, he undertakes to personally return Gellert Grindelwald to prison within a week. The agreement is valid for five years from the moment of signing and will be sealed by two unbreakable vows one between Wolfgang Schmidt and Gellert Grindelwald and the other between Albus Dumbledore and Gellert Grindelwald. This document can be disclosed by the Ministry of Magic of Germany without discussion with other parties of the agreement. After signing the oath and the agreement, Grindelwald said, God, so many points. It feels like I almost destroyed the world. Minister. The next morning, owls spread shocking news worldwide, Grindelwald is free. The entire world shuddered at this phrase, and hundreds of wizards headed towards Germany to confirm the news. Thus, the Minister of Magic in Germany had to show the original agreement and explain that Grindelwald escaped on September 1, but now there is an agreement that restrains him. When he said this, representatives from different countries jumped up, shouting, the agreement only mentions Germany, not the whole world. Do you take us for fools? Every line specifies points about Germany, and only two lines about the rest of the world, and that's in small print. While Minister Schmidt was calming down representatives of the international community, Dumbledore and Grindelwald had already headed to France. Not to burn Paris, but to meet another prophet, Nicholas Flamel. Chapter 16 15.2, Hitchhiking Across Europe Approaching what seemed to be an old and abandoned house at first glance, Dumbledore knocked on the door. Before he could say anything, a clear voice emerged from the door lock, saying, Who are you, and what brings you here? Albus Dumbledore and Gellert Grindelwald are here to meet Nicholas Flamel, Dumbledore replied. Just wait a moment. You are allowed to enter, the voice said. With these words, the door opened revealing not a deserted shack but a vast new world gardens, meadows, forests, and in the midst of it all, a majestic mansion styled in 13th century classicism. Walking along the path and looking towards the mansion, they noticed the house's door opening, and an old man and woman emerged. It was Nicholas Flamel and his wife, Pernell Flamel. Approaching them, Albus said, It's been a while, Nicholas. Not that long, Albus. You recently begged me for the Philosopher's Stone, Nicholas replied. Grindelwald coughed, hearing this conversation. Albus, you said you're not afraid of death. It's necessary for my plan to capture Voldemort. And this little one, oh, he had potential, but he immersed himself too much in dark magic, thus corrupting his soul. Enough about that. Nicholas, we came to you on business. What could two lords of demons, black and white, need from an old man like me, especially when one of you already took the only valuable thing I have? aside from my wife. Nicholas said, exaggerating his tone. May we sit? The conversation promises to be lengthy, Dumbledore said. Enter, Lisa will finish preparing lunch soon, Pernell said, calling out, Lisa, prepare two more servings for lunch. All right, ma'am. Who is this? Grindelwald asked. Just an alchemical puppet. Take a seat, Albus, Nicholas said, offering a chair to Dumbledore. And you, he added, handing a peculiar dragonskin-covered chest to Grindelwald. Hey, this is unfair. Why is he sitting on a chair, and I'm on a chest? Grindelwald protested. Because he didn't burn Paris. The Flamels retorted with a growl. Grindelwald, I sense unwarranted malice. Straight face, all right, 
tell us what's going on. First, allow me to ask you, Nicholas, when was the last time you prophesied? Hey? Not for a while. The future doesn't particularly interest me, it won't affect me. Although I didn't expect Grindelwald to escape from prison, and you would bring him to me. Cough, well then, let's do this. First, you take the crystal ball and try making a prophecy about the future. Then we'll talk. Why so mysterious? Can't you just tell me? Nicholas suspiciously remarked. It's better if you see it for yourself. Besides, you wouldn't want the entire room filled with hookah smoke, would you? Fine, wait here, I'll be back soon. After five minutes, Nicholas Flamel rushed into the room, clearly moving at a speed unsuitable for his age, with his eyes ablaze, asking, Who is it, Albus? Speak quickly. Calm down, Nicholas. What happened? Pernell asked in puzzlement. You know, the last time she saw such a look in her husband's eyes was probably a couple of hundred years ago. Perry, you don't understand. I saw a beautiful future, and most importantly, we're young again. What? You see, although the Philosopher's Stone can make people live forever, it's more of a forced attachment of the soul to the body and replenishing the body's functions through the excessive consumption of the life energy of the Philosopher's Stone. Although if the Flamels wish, they can live for many more centuries, but such a life becomes tiresome. Due to constant aging and weakening of the body, Nicholas had even explored the forbidden zone of alchemists, the transformation of the human body. Although he managed to restore much of the body's functions, it was still far from the life he had at the beginning of his journey. Therefore, seeing a future now where he and Pernell are young and healthy again, he couldn't contain himself. Speak, Albus. Both Flamels yelled this time. Cough, cough, let me go. You'll strangle me. Oops, sorry, I got too worked up, and my alchemical implants activated. Cough, cough, Dumbledore cleared his throat. Grindelwald, in the meantime, said, in Paris, you looked like you were about to fall apart. Eyes closed face, that's none of your business. Tell us, what happened to the world I saw? Calm down, Nico, we didn't intend to hide this. We came to you precisely because of this, Dumbledore said, still feeling a lump in his throat. This lad, Asmodeus Norin Morningstar, a student at Hogwarts. After he joined Ravenclaw, Trelawney made a prophecy. As I understand, around the same time, Grindelwald made his own. That's why he escaped. Trelawney? Cassandra Trelawney? No, her great-granddaughter. Not everyone can live for centuries without noticing it, like you. All right, I'm not particularly interested in this. Tell me everything you know about this boy. Well, actually. I've only known him for about a month or so, and Grindelwald has known about him for the second day. At least give me some hints about him, a person can't just fall from the sky. He's an orphan who awakened his magic late, so he entered Hogwarts at 13, and he has an incredible affinity with the element of fire. That's all I can say. Stop, an affinity with the element of fire. What's his middle name? Repeat it again. Noran. That's definitely not a first name. No, the first name is Asmodeus. The second is Noran and the last name is Morningstar. All right, it's not that important. What Nicholas didn't mention was that a couple of decades ago, he encountered a young man named Norm in the mountains, and they could communicate using magic. Surprisingly, the young man wasn't particularly amazed by magic. Upon closer inspection, Nicholas felt a vibrant flame energy within him, even though he was a squib. This contradiction made Nicholas remember him. Perhaps this child is his descendant, he thought. Okay, so I understand that you didn't just come to tell me about him. What do you plan to do? We want to gather authorities in the magical world to help him. All right, and who's in the group? Currently, it's you, me, and Grindelwald. What did you expect? I just rescued this criminal and came to you, I haven't had time to do more. Okay, where are you heading next? We thought of spending the night here and then heading to Dorset, Newt lives there now. Scamander. Yes. I remember him, the boy with an affinity for animals a pleasant young man. He's 94 now. Although for you, everyone is probably young. Wait, did anyone ask for my opinion? How will a zoologist help us? He's just an ordinary wizard. First, no one asked, and second, 
he managed to thwart your plans many times. Grindelwald, this world is set against me. Mew underscore Mew. Okay, then, let me show you to your bedrooms. Do you need separate ones? Cough, cough, separate ones will do, said Dumbledore. But then he heard the sound of something falling behind them. It turned out that when Grindelwald was about to stand up and follow them, he accidentally knocked over a box he was sitting on. Guess what he saw? Hundreds of brightly red philosopher's stones rolled out of the box on which he had been sitting for the past hour. Grindelwald, O underscore O. Dumbledore, looking at Nicholas. Nicholas. While Dumbledore and his company traveled the world, gathering talents. Asmodeus gradually accumulated points by completing daily tasks. Ding, try the taste of fish from the Black Lake, ten points obtained. Ding, congratulations on achieving the first flight after entering Hogwarts, broomsticks are uncomfortable, look at my flight as Iron Man, achievement, twenty-five points obtained. Ding, weekly task completed, earn one hundred points for Ravenclaw House, fifty points obtained. And so on. After a couple of weeks of hard work, Asmodeus had accumulated a total of 500 points. Adding this to his previously earned points, it amounted to 770 points. I'm getting close to purchasing my first passive income source. So, besides the weekly task of earning academy points, what do we have for today? Ding, deal with the troll in the bathroom. Ding, save Hermione. Introduce yourself to Harry Potter. These tasks form a series, and depending on the success of their completion, the host, Asmodeus, receives different rewards and a Halloween gift set. Halloween? Stop, what's today's date? Ding, October 31, 1991. Ah, they say that youth passes the fastest, I didn't even notice two months passing. After classes, he headed to the Great Hall for dinner. Evening. The Great Hall of Hogwarts Castle was adorned with Halloween decorations. A thousand bats fluttered across the walls and ceiling, and more hovered over the dining table like low black clouds, making the candle flames flicker in the pumpkin bellies. The golden plates on the long table were filled with more abundant food than usual, resembling a dinner party at the beginning of the school year. Ronald, have you seen Hermione? I haven't seen her all afternoon, Harry sat at the Greyfinder table. I heard Paddle tell her friend that Hermione cried all afternoon in the women's bathroom in the basement. Oh, who cares about her? Ronald munched on the pie. She always likes to lecture others, didn't you notice? She doesn't have any friends. Everyone can't stand her. But we're from the same academy, and she has a friend from Ravenclaw, Harry frowned slightly. There are too many people in the same academy as us. Besides, she's a traitor. Talking to those nerds from Ravenclaw, she might as well go there. And what if she's in the same house as us, is it possible that I make everyone to please and accommodate? Ronald still didn't care. At the same time, sitting at the Ravenclaw table closest to the entrance, Asmodeus confirmed that he didn't see Hermione and ate while waiting for Quirrell, who was supposed to appear any minute. After a short wait, the gate of the hall suddenly opened, and Professor Quirrell ran in from outside in a panic. There is, troll, it's, in the dungeon. I thought you should know. After speaking, Quirrell fell directly to the floor and passed out. As soon as everyone heard about the troll, there was an immediate commotion in the hall, and the little wizards looked terrified. Quiet. Since Professor Dumbledore was absent, and Professor McGonagall took his place, she had to make several piercing pyrotechnic explosions from the tip of her wand. Only then did the hall become quiet. Prefects, lead the students of your houses back to the dormitories immediately. Greyfinder students will come with me. Seeing this, Percy quickly stood up and beckoned for the youngsters to follow him back to the dormitory. Wait, Ronald, we can't go back in this state. Harry Potter was about to leave when something suddenly sounded. Hermione is still in the basement bathroom, she doesn't know about the troll yet. Do we have to do this? Ronald hesitated for a moment. Well, I hope Percy won't find out. They didn't notice that as they left the hall and headed to the girls' bathroom, a shadow of Asmodeus, who had been waiting for them, flickered behind them. He couldn't do anything about it, the task stated to introduce himself to Harry would be difficult if he just killed the troll while no one was watching. At the same time, in the basement bathroom, the little witch Hermione Granger sat on the floor, holding her head in her hands, crying sadly. Earlier in the day, there were charms classes, and the content of Professor Flitwick's lectures still involved flying spells. 
many young wizards had already mastered this magic skillfully. Let feathers fly. But Ronald, sitting to her right, still couldn't pronounce the spell accurately. The little witch kindly pointed out Ronald's mistakes. Eventually, Ronald yelled at her, and Hermione walked behind after class, hearing Ronald saying nasty things to Harry Potter. He said she had no friends in Gryffindor. This upset the little witch. For two months since the start of classes, she had worked diligently to earn points and tried to win the House Cup for Gryffindor. But people around me seem not to care. The sense of discord with Gryffindor grew stronger. There were times when Hermione thought that if she had been sorted into Ravenclaw or Hufflepuff or even Slytherin, it wouldn't have been so bad. She cried in the bathroom for half a day, but no one came looking for her. Certainly, it confirmed Ronald's earlier words. Hermione felt like she really had no friends. Oh, let's see who it is. When Hermione was feeling sad, a familiar voice suddenly appeared in front of her. The little witch rubbed her face, lifted her head with tears in her eyes, just in time to see Asmodeus entering the bathroom with Athena on his shoulder. Asmodeus. How did you find me? Went by the sounds of crying echoing throughout the castle. I thought if I didn't come, our Miss Granger would cry here until tomorrow. Asmodeus handed the little witch a piece of paper. I didn't cry. The little witch muttered. However, most of the sadness in my heart immediately dispersed. In any case. She also has a friend, Asmodeus. Who said you don't have friends? Honestly, I didn't expect anyone to care so much about others' opinions. Cried for half a day because of the words of an idiot who can't even learn a basic spell. Asmodeus shrugged. Hey? You already know. Of course. Asmodeus is familiar with the plot, how could he not know what happened on Halloween night? There are just many things that prevent him from explaining to Hermione in advance how the world works. Maybe I should have come earlier and told Hermione not to pay attention to other people's opinions? But lessons can only be learned from one's own bitter experience. In fact, Hermione is not annoying or anything like that, she just craves approval too much. I don't know what it is, but it is. Asmodeus believes that if you seek approval, it should only be from significant figures, certainly not from those who are clearly worse than you. I just wanted to remind him of what I did wrong. Obviously, I worked very hard to add academy points, but they regularly deduct points because of their stupidity, but it feels like no one in Gryffindor cares except me. The little witch became agitated from her grievances and burst into tears again. No, you were wrong from the beginning. Asmodeus shook his head. Seeing that the little witch suspiciously looked at him, he continued. Remember why you came to Hogwarts? To help your classmates? Or to help your academy win the Academy Cup? No, of course. I guess it's for her studying. That's right. To explore this mysterious magic full of enchanting wonders. So why should you care about others, just mind your own business, study, read books? Do you mean I shouldn't interfere in their affairs? But I... The witch opened her mouth. Before she could finish speaking, Asmodeus interrupted her with a pat on the head. Of course, kindness Miss Granger, that's good, but if the cost of this kindness is that you are hated, what's the point? Be selfish, you owe nothing to anyone. You'll see how these idiots will crawl on their knees to ask for your homework. And you'll send them away. But you actively accumulate points for your academy too. This is also to some extent an expression of my selfishness. I'm not trying to please anyone, I'm trying to gain more knowledge and power, and the points are just a bonus. I can't tell her about the system. Hearing Asmodeus's words, Hermione began to gradually understand. Do you want me to tell you folk wisdom from my homeland? Seeing the effectiveness of his words, he decided to explain it all the way. In fact, when you skillfully master this wisdom, you will find that 90% of your life problems disappear. Don't interfere where you're not asked, it's not your problems, let them figure it out themselves. Asmodeus shrugged and said. At that moment, heavy footsteps could be heard near the bathroom. They were so heavy that even the ground began to tremble slightly. Look, trouble is approaching. You cried in the bathroom for half a day because of someone's words. Not only did no one come to comfort you, but they exposed you to danger. During the conversation, the owner of the footsteps also approached the bathroom door. A powerful body over five meters tall emitted a foul odor. In his hand, he also carried a huge club. It was the troll that Professor Quirrell had talked about. The troll approached the bathroom door and, seeing two small wizards inside, 
immediately showed excited eyes. Quarrel hadn't fed him for three whole days to ensure that he would cause enough commotion in Hogwarts. Asmodeus, be careful, it's a troll. The knowledgeable little witch immediately recognized the troll, screamed in surprise, and subconsciously hid behind Asmodeus, trembling with tension. No need to be afraid. Asmodeus patted the little witch on the shoulder to calm her. It's just a minor inconvenience. But before I get rid of him, I hope you can think about whether it's worth it. Let those who really care about you worry about you because of some insignificant person. It's not just me, it's also Professor McGonagall and the other professors. Do you know you're their favorite? Having said that, Asmodeus looked at the troll approaching him. The mountain troll was delighted with the appearance of food. The troll raised a large club and swung it at Asmodeus. But here's the catch before the club could touch Asmodeus's head, he calmly dodged, stepping to the right. I heard you have high magic resistance, I wonder how much. Saying this, Asmodeus extended his right hand forward, leaving Hermione behind to avoid crossfire. On the palm of Asmodeus's hand, flames began to appear, but he didn't release it immediately. Instead, he let the fire accumulate and condense for a few seconds. Just as the troll was about to swing for the second time. Asmodeus said, I hope the castle walls can withstand this. Uttering these words, a dense flame burst from Asmodeus's hand, hitting the troll directly. The troll was already screaming in pain and the sensation of burning alive. The flame surrounded the troll from all sides due to the too strong flow, filling the corridor with fire. When Asmodeus noticed that the stones making up the castle walls began to turn red, he stopped releasing the fire. All that remained of the troll was a pile of ashes and the smell of burnt flesh lingering in the air. Hermione, degree degree. You, how did you do that? No wand, no spell. It is what professors call connection with fire. She thought. At that moment, two heads with singed hair appeared from around the corner. It turned out to be Harry and Ronald, who had rushed to the bathroom in alarm. They only had to turn the corner, but a pillar of flame blocked their path. They barely managed to dodge, so they were unharmed, but their hair was now smoking. Waiting for the flames to dissipate, they cautiously stuck their heads out and noticed Asmodeus retracting the fire back into his hand. Did you do that? Harry skeptically looked at Asmodeus, who didn't even break a sweat, and the pile of ashes emitting a meaty smell. Good evening, Mr. Potter, yes, it was me. Asmodeus nodded, then looked at Ronald, who was still in shock, and said. Mr. Weasley, I'm not interested in teaching you life principles, but I want to say. Take care of yourself because not everyone responds with kindness to evil, as Hermione does, he added while flames played in his hands. Oh, mate, I'm so sorry. Harry knew Asmodeus was standing up for Hermione, putting him in a dilemma friends on both sides. I want to say a few words about Ronald. But I don't know what to say. It's clearly Ron's fault. Mr. Potter, nice to meet you, my name is Asmodeus Norin. I see great potential in you and you value friendship, but you need to learn to choose your friends. This, I. I'm not saying the Weasley family is bad, quite the opposite. The twins are very interesting kids. But every barrel of honey has its fly. A person who doesn't understand what's good and what's bad isn't the best choice for a friend. Harry fell silent, he didn't know what to answer. Fortunately, Harry's embarrassment was interrupted by the sound of hurried footsteps. Professor McGonagall and the old bat Snape quickly approached the bathroom. What are you doing here? Why aren't you in your common rooms? And where's the troll? She said, not holding back her anger. Professor McGonagall, don't fret. The troll is here, Asmodeus pointed to the large pile of ash. Upon hearing this, Snape immediately went to check. Mr. Morningstar, now is not the time for jokes, but before he could finish, Snape looking strangely at Asmodeus, said. He's not lying. It's the ashes left from burning the troll. Some potions use their meat, and the smell and taste are the same. All right, then who will explain what happened here? I will. Said Hermione, but Asmodeus shook his head and began to tell everything in detail, including why Hermione ended up here. Mr. Weasley, I'm very disappointed in you, and Mr. Potter, you should not blindly agree with everything your friends say. Both of you lose 25 points, Professor McGonagall said. And you, Miss Granger, should not pay attention to what others say about you. I already, no, Hermione nodded. What about you, Mr. Morningstar? 
100 points to Ravenclaw for your determination to protect your classmates and the incredible use of the fire spell. All right, go to your rooms, Professor McGonagall said. Asmodeus nodded and headed to the Ravenclaw Tower, first asking Hermione if she could make it to the Gryffindor dormitory on her own. She said yes. When all four left the corridor, Snape said, Professor McGonagall, the flame's intensity. And this is not devilish fire but a simple fire spell, look here. Hearing this, McGonagall approached the wall Snape was pointing to, and when she got closer, she felt that the stones were clearly heated. No wonder the hat mentioned his connection to fire, it's incredible. We were only gone for a few minutes, how powerful was the fire? At that moment, Asmodeus had already reached his room and mentally said. System. Ding, congratulations to the owner on completing a series of tasks. Your grade is S+. Plus. The task was perfectly executed. You destroyed the troll. Saved Hermione Granger. Left an impression as a reliable friend and comrade to Harry Potter. Congratulations. The reward will be 500 points and Halloween gift set. Receive. Of course, yes. The gift package has been sent to the system warehouse. The current balance is 1,270 points. Do you want to open the gift package? Yes. So far he was very relaxed, except he didn't know that a meeting with the old men and authorities of the entire magical world was coming up. Chapter 17, Hey? Do you want to open the gift package? Yes. Ding, the host receives 50 points. Ding, the host receives a book, basic body strengthening with mana slash chi slash internal energy. Ding, the host receives a dragon feed package, Halloween themed feed molds, dot. Ding, the host currently has 1310 points. Do you want to use them? Yes, open the trading center. Asmodeus already knew what he wanted to buy, so he continued immediately. Buy the guide to the development of magical knights, includes a guide to building magical rings around the heart and basic meditation sets for accumulating mana in the heart. Ding, purchase made. 1,000 points deducted. Your balance is now 310. Do you want to continue shopping? No, that's all for now. I want to see what I bought for 1,000, Asmodeus said, closing the system and holding three books in his hands. In the first one, a swordsman was depicted casting a spell with a free hand. The second showed a magical circle with a person sitting inside it. The third book was thicker than the previous two but still small. The cover featured a heart with runes and three rings drawn over it. While Asmodeus examined the books, a notification sounded. Ding, does the host wish to memorize the books in memory? It will cost 10 points for simple memorization and 50 for full comprehension. Why didn't you say that before? Of course, yes, full comprehension. Ding, remaining balance 260. But Asmodeus didn't hear the second sound of the system. He was actively absorbing knowledge. After half an hour, Asmodeus sat on the floor, breathing heavily. I thought this would be much easier. Absorbing knowledge from a thousand pages in half an hour not only affected Asmodeus's mental state but also his physical one. Returning to his room after a meal in the hall, he asked Terry not to disturb him. Somehow, he found chalk and began drawing a magic circle on the floor. After a couple of minutes, Asmodeus sat inside the circle and crossed his legs. Okay. Gradually introduce the energy gathered in the circle into the body and extend it to the heart. It's a good thing I have internal energy without meditation. This significantly reduces the chance of failure. That means, wizards could become magical swordsmen themselves if they wanted, with much more mana. But it's unclear why they would do that. Okay, outline, form the ring, and the preservation rune. Success. Feeling how a new source of magic spread from his chest throughout his body with each heartbeat, Asmodeus said. Stop, something's wrong. Mentally delving into his body, Asmodeus saw that the mana leaving his heart was blue and collided with the dark red flame energy in his blood. Changes occurred. Suddenly, as if receiving a signal to attack, the red energy directed towards his heart, and the dark blue mana, gradually turning into the heart, began to change its appearance. New accumulation and fire runes formed on the heart, and the previously blue mana ring now consisted of red energy. Ding. Congratulations to the host on the first body transformation and the achievement of Heart of Fire. Ding, results of the analysis of changes in the host's body, Heart of Fire, allows accumulating and producing flame energy independently of surrounding magical elements. Ding, 
a new skill has been unlocked, Flame Wave, when used, the ring of fiery energy around the heart releases all accumulated fire energy around the body, creating a powerful area attack. The skill's weakness is that the host cannot use any magic for a minute after using it. Ding, a passive skill acquired, unburnt, attacks with ordinary fire cannot damage you. P.S. Magic fire still inflicts damage, but it's reduced by 10%. Dot. While Asmodeus listened to the incessant system notifications, trying to understand why his heart had mutated, he decided to ask the system even though he already had a guess. System, why did the mutation occur? Ding, this meditation and body strengthening technique is designed for only three levels, so it's considered a low-level reinforcement technique. Your lineage is considered high level for this meditation technique, so the energy flowing in your blood absorbs and transforms the mana collected from the air into something new. Does it have any drawbacks? No, in fact, it only has benefits. All right, thought Asmodeus. Just as he was pondering this, a knock on the door interrupted his thoughts. Mr. Morningstar, the headmaster asked me to call you, Professor McGonagall's voice was heard. Hey. Chapter 18, Oh, So Many Old People. Hearing the voice behind the door, Asmodeus was puzzled. Wasn't Dumbledore missing for two months because Grindelwald escaped? Asmodeus knew that Grindelwald had escaped, and Dumbledore had gone after him, but he didn't think it was directly related to him. He considered it just a butterfly effect, having little impact on the freedom of this lover of old B. So, being 90% sure that Dumbledore wanted to ask about the troll, he said to Professor. McGonagall, good evening, Professor. Do you know why the headmaster is looking for me? Good evening, dear. I don't know, but it's definitely for something good. McGonagall said cunningly. Let's go, I'll take you to him. Uh-huh, nodded Asmodeus. But the further they walked, the stranger his facial expression became. He thought, isn't the headmaster's office in the tower? Why are we going downstairs? After five minutes, he understood where they were going but didn't understand why they were here and not to the headmaster's office. Professor McGonagall's office was on the second floor of Hogwarts. Opening the door, McGonagall let him in and then closed the door behind him. Professor McGonagall, where is the headmaster? We'll get to him soon. He's at the Hog's Head Inn. Don't look at me like that. I don't know either. Wait a moment, I need to get Flo Powder. Saying this, McGonagall went to her bedroom to get Flo Powder, leaving Asmodeus to ponder, why is Dumbledore waiting for me at the Hog's Head Inn and not in his office? Also, doesn't Aberforth hate Albus? His thoughts were interrupted again by Minerva McGonagall's voice. Are you ready? She asked, shaking a pouch with green powder pouring out from the edges. Yes. Do you know how to use this? Yes, throw it into the fireplace and clearly say the name of the place you want to go to. Correct. I'll go first, and you repeat after me. Saying this, she took a handful of flow powder and handed it to Asmodeus. Professor McGonagall threw a similar handful into the fireplace and shouted, Hog's head in, disappearing in the flames. Shrugging, Asmodeus did the same. Hog's head in. A second later, along with a cough, Asmodeus emerged from the fireplace, shaking off the ash. Raising his head, he froze in place. Underscore. Do you know why? Because fifty pairs of eyes were looking at him. Not the attention given to a new visitor. No. At the moment, tables and chairs were arranged around the fireplace, as if awaiting someone's arrival. Asmodeus simply didn't want to think that fifty centenarians had gathered because of him, but his hope was interrupted by Dumbledore's voice from the middle of the room. Oh, here he is, dear friends, Asmodeus Norin Morningstar. Professor Dumbledore, may I ask what all this is about? Asmodeus asked uncertainly. He was sure that no one knew about the method to make muggles use magic. It's impossible. It's been just over two hours since he received it, and so many people already know? Impossible. And certainly impossible for these people to gather because of a troll. So, Asmodeus was extremely puzzled. Don't be nervous, boy. We're all here to get to know you, and most importantly, help you achieve your goals. What are the goals you are talking about? Underscore. Asmodeus didn't understand. Okay, kid, enough pretending. We know you can turn muggles into wizards. Someone from the crowd shouted. Asmodeus. Omega. All right, it seems I do have something like that. But first, 
can you explain why you need it, and how did you find out? Asmodeus said firmly, gradually accumulating magic in his feet and palms. Calm down, kid, we're not your enemies. We just want to help. Who are you? Allow me to introduce myself, my name is Gellert Grindelwald. A pioneer on the path to revolution and the one who started the first wizarding war. Asmodeus, and raised his right hand, flames gathering. Don't come closer, though I know you handle fire well. I don't think you're better than me. Asmodeus exclaimed. Grindelwald, what did I do? Everyone else in the room. Seeing that the situation was not going well, Dumbledore stood up and walked towards Asmodeus. All right, Mr. Morningstar, calm down. We're here to help you and become friends, not to fight. Besides, I don't think your fire can harm anyone present, Dumbledore confidently said. Oh? Are your bodies stronger than trolls? Asmodeus asked with a hint of sarcasm and surprise. Dumbledore turned around and looked at McGonagall. Professor McGonagall, Phi Omega Phi. Everyone else present also turned to McGonagall. Ahem, um, yes, a troll recently got into Hogwarts. And Mr. Morningstar burned it to a pile of ashes, and the castle walls even blushed from the heat. McGonagall's voice became quieter as she spoke. Old folks. Uh, kid, put your hand down. We really don't intend to harm you. Asmodeus, then why did you bring him here? He's a hardened criminal, he said, pointing a finger at Grindelwald. Grindelwald, this world is against me, underscore. Old folks, well, he's already received his punishment. Asmodeus. Your arguments are clear, but I don't accept them. Dumbledore, all right, Asmodeus, we're here because of a prophecy. Asmodeus, what prof? And then he understood. Damn it, although Trelawney behaves like a lunatic most of the time, she's a real prophet. And all the prophecies she spoke in an unconscious state came true. So, he asked, Professor Trelawney. Dumbledore, yes and no. Not only her. For example, Gellert got out of prison because he saw something on the day you entered Hogwarts. And there in the corner, Nicholas Flamel also saw this prophecy, but a little later. We're all gathered here because of what we saw in the prophecy. Asmodeus finally understood that these old folks gathered here because of the future made possible by the system. But he didn't expect even the old immortal Nicholas Flamel to be here. And he didn't understand what this hermit could see that made him come here. So, he asked. Tell me what you saw. It's easier to show, said Grindelwald, pulling out his hookah. A couple of minutes later, the old folks were very excited. Although they had seen this prophecy many times, they couldn't help but be excited when they saw it. Asmodeus was silent. He finally admitted the reason for all this. Although he expected the world to change dramatically thanks to the system, seeing it personally still surprised him. And naturally, he understood why even Dumbledore, whom he considered an opponent of any change, was ready to support him. Everyone has their regrets in life. For Dumbledore, it's Ariana, or rather, the entire tragedy of the Dumbledore family. In the prophecy, he saw Ariana Dumbledore alive, meaning he managed to obtain a method to resurrect people. Moreover, even those who died decades ago. Well, do you believe it now? Yes, but I am going to disappoint you. What you just saw is definitely not the immediate future. The only thing I can achieve right now is to make some talented muggles learn magic. Asmodeus replied. When he finished, he saw that the excitement did not leave the faces of these elders, on the contrary, it intensified. Understanding the reason for his confusion, Nicholas Flamel said, Child, you didn't think we expect instant changes from you, did you? Honestly, we old folks should be ashamed of burdening you like this. But instead of saying you can't do it, you just confirmed the promised future. That's why they are all happy. All right, kid, can you tell us how you plan to act and how you can make muggles perform magic? Someone from the crowd asked a bit excitedly. Chapter 19, Wizards of the Second Generation and Truth Upon hearing this, Asmodeus nodded gracefully. First, allow me to explain the most crucial aspect to you. The starting point. What will enable talented muggles and even those less so, with the help of wizards, to use magic? As Asmodeus spoke, he pulled a piece of chalk from his pocket and began drawing a mana accumulation circle around himself. So, do you see this magical circle? Mr. Nicholas Flamel should somewhat understand what it's created for, right? 
I see runes for accumulation and preservation, but I don't think it's used just to store mana. There's a part of the circle I don't quite grasp, Mr. Flamel remarked. Mr. Flamel, the distinguished alchemical genius, I see merely peculiar symbols with lines drawn around them, one of the elders chimed in. Yeah, I don't understand anything about runes, just some doodles, someone else added. Ahem. Asmodeus redirected attention from the discussion about the circle back to himself. Mr. Flamel is telling the truth. This circle is used for mana accumulation and keeping it in place. But the most crucial part of this circle is the rune's direction and introduction. It's my own development based on the rune's path and seeking for the direction runes and an altered rune penetration, he said without blushing. Well, actually, it could indeed be considered his creation. The magical accumulation circle wouldn't have appeared in this world without him and the system, and the system wouldn't have emerged without him. Moreover, after paying 50 points for the complete absorption of knowledge in those books, he truly became an expert in runes and everything related to those books. The main purpose of this circle is to help a person guide magic into their heart and form what I call energy rings around them. With each new ring, the amount of mana produced by the heart will increase, and upon completing the third ring, it will lead to qualitative changes in the person's body. The constant influence of magic will gradually assimilate into the person's heart, allowing the heart to generate mana independently, regardless of the presence or absence of the rings. Although, at the moment, this method cannot fully equate muggles to wizards due to the body's saturation level with magic. This method has advantages over natural-born wizards. What I call impact magic, spreading throughout the body from the heart, will strengthen a person's physical abilities. Wizards like us, who rely on manipulating energy in our blood and around us, also, in a sense, have a physical advantage over muggles, but it lies in bodily strength and the so-called life force of the entire organism. That's why wizards, on average, live much longer than muggles. For example, our previous Hogwarts headmaster, Armando Dippet, is still alive. To your knowledge, he's already 354 years old. Cough, cough, is this lad cursing me? A cough echoed from the end of the hall. Asmodeus turned and saw an old man with a beard twice as long as Dumbledore sitting in a wheelchair. Asmodeus smiled and said. Good evening, Elder Dippet. I hope you can help me confirm my theory. So please answer, have you ever used something like Mr. Flamel's Philosopher's Stone or anything else to extend your life? Cough, cough, no, lad. Honestly, I still don't understand why I'm still alive. Well, without me you wouldn't have lasted long, thought Asmodeus, nodding to the second eldest person here. As you can see, the more powerful the wizard and the more mana within, the longer the lifespan and even the quality of life. By the way, a little off topic, but you old folks might find this very interesting. The construction of rings around the heart is not exclusive to muggles and squibs and full-fledged wizards can also use the technique I've created. This will allow you to strengthen your body and extend your life. Moreover, though it's not so crucial in the case of those present, it will, to some extent, increase the amount of mana in the body and the level of its control. Mr. Dippet, I'd be happy to guide you if you allow it. Cough, cough. Let's give it a try, lad. Not that I fear death, but if I can walk again, I wouldn't mind living another dozen years or so, he said as his assistant, or better to say, pupil, pushed the wheelchair into the circle. Mr. Dippet, you must have already felt the magic of the circle, haven't you? Yes, it feels like I can peer into myself. Interesting magic. This is the influence of the search and direction runes. Close your eyes, and you can feel the mana surrounding you at the moment. You need to grasp it and mentally direct it toward your heart. Armando Dippet closed his eyes and began to sense the magic around him. I feel it, the magic in the circle is about five times denser than outside. I think if I draw such a circle in my bedroom, even without the rings, I could live another couple of years. You are to some extent right. Actually, if a magical circle is drawn on an enlarged scale in the classrooms where young wizards are taught, it could enhance the efficiency of their education. Unfortunately, it would reduce their natural sensitivity to magic, which, in my opinion, is more crucial than rapid progress. Now, let's continue. Headmaster, can you grasp the magic in the air around you? Yes, it's as if I have an additional invisible hand. Good, now direct the mana flow through your veins and arteries toward your heart, completing a full rotation around it to form the ring. Once you've formed the ring, take a small portion of that mana and carefully carve the accumulation and preservation runes on your heart. 
Do it slowly and precisely, making sure not to cut too deep, so that in case of further improvement to this technique, you can replace the rune. While Asmodeus spoke, Mr. Dippet had already immersed himself deeply in the process of carving the runes on his heart. He tried to do it as finely and cautiously as possible, he didn't want to die from such foolishness as piercing his heart. It seems ready, well. Before the former headmaster could finish, he felt surges of magic emanating from his heart. It felt as if waves from the shores of England were constantly washing over the body of this 354-year-old man. Seeing that Armando Dippet fell silent, his apprentice wanted to approach and ask if everything was all right, but Asmodeus stopped him, saying. Everything is fine. He successfully formed the ring and carved the runes, just let him feel the changes. While Asmodeus spoke, Armando Dippet had already realized the changes in his body. Slowly, leaning on the arms of the wheelchair, he began to rise, and, seeing how his apprentice's eyes were about to pop out from amazement, Armando finally stood on his feet. Haha. <laughs> I haven't walked on my own for ten years. I feel great. Guys, you definitely need to do the same, especially you, Nico. This old man had a smile from ear to ear. Asmodeus was surprised that his jaw prosthesis hadn't fallen out yet. As you can all see, mana rings can not only allow muggles to use magic, but, according to my preliminary calculations, will increase the expected average lifespan in the magical world by 30%. To be honest, the lifespan didn't matter much to these old folks, most of them were well over 80, except for some newcomers. But the prospect of strengthening their bodies excited them greatly. While Dumbledore might be able to jump and skip at 110, not everyone's bodies retained their former capabilities. Cough, cough, Asmodeus regained the attention of the elderly. We got a bit sidetracked, I'll continue. According to my observations, wizards expend 40% of their own magical power while casting spells and the rest is supplemented by ambient magic in the air. Unfortunately, the rings cannot enable a muggle to tap into external mana, as they already accumulate it from the air themselves. Therefore, the new generation of wizards will find it more challenging to cast spells, and they'll lag in endurance during battles. But since my future plan relies on muggles not fearing wizards and matching them in strength, I've thought about this. Saying this, he pulled out a leaflet from his pocket and, after casting a copying spell, handed it to everyone present. What you see here is an alchemical weapon I developed, swords, rapiers, spears, and so on. They will have runes similar to those on the heart carved into them. This will help new wizards in casting spells and using magic, somewhat like magical wands but with their own characteristics. I chose various forms of cold weapons because, according to my calculations, the physical strength, upon completing the three rings, can reach the level of three adults combined and may become the primary combat method for new wizards. Especially since, over time, due to the constant exposure to magic, the weapon will evolve alongside its owner. Honestly, I've already contemplated crafting a pair of enchanted blades for myself. By doing so, we will balance the powers of both sides to prevent conflicts in the future. The emergence of a new group of people in the magical world will inevitably lead to a new stage of resource distribution. For fair competition, the strengths of the parties must be roughly equal. Additionally, this will to some extent reduce the influence of the theory of blood purity. I have also developed combat methods based on the new system. Asmodeus spoke without pause until he felt that the gazes directed at him carried an unfamiliar emotion. So, he stopped and asked. Uh, did I say something wrong? Why are you all looking at me like that? Are you really just 13 years old? Asked Pernell Flamel. Can't you tell? Well, it's just difficult for all of us to understand why a 13-year-old behaves like a seasoned storyteller. Besides, you managed to do what hundreds and thousands of wizards before you couldn't, give magic to muggles, she continued. Well. Well, anyway, I was going to find a way through that world. Actually, you're right, Mrs. Flamel. I'm not 13 years old, I'm 20, and moreover, I'm not from this world. For a moment, complete silence hung in the bar. Ahem, ahem. Dumbledore cleared his throat and asked, Uh, Key. Mr. Morningstar, what do you mean by that? Asmodeus began to tell his story, hiding all the information about the system and his first life. He told only about his life as a firebender. Chapter 20, 19.2, Planning and Action and Patreon. So I woke up in this world and ended up in the shelter. Actually, Asmodeus had long contemplating whether to share the story of his origin. 
what did it matter? After all, he wasn't revealing his trump card. Damn it, he was tired of being looked at as a child. Though being back at the beginning of his life was pleasant, and the hormones of a 13-year-old body sometimes made him act impulsively and childishly. But. He was a renowned 20-year-old warrior in the Avatar world and an 18-year-old student on Earth. How do you think it feels when professors and even these old folks treat him like a 13-year-old child? It's torture. If this continues, Asmodeus doesn't know how much longer he can endure it. He only spoke about his life as a fire mage and never revealed anything about his first life or the system. Those were his trump cards, and he would never tell anyone about them in his life. After Asmodeus's narrative, the room fell silent again, with only the sound of a cricket playing an unknown melody continuing. All right, let us digest this. You're a warrior of the Fire Nation in another world. There's a war going on in your world, and the Fire Nation is trying to conquer the world because the so-called Avatar disappeared. You disagreed with the Fire Nation's ambitions and decided to journey to the Earth Kingdom, where you were mistaken for a spy. Since you didn't want to attack Earth Mages to avoid accidentally killing them, you fled to the mountains, where you fell into a hidden cave, and after some period of time, you woke up on the riverbank in England in a young body. Dumbledore said with an expression of disbelief and confusion on his face. Dumbledore, underscore. Asmodeus. Sorry, kid, but I don't believe you. This sounds like the ramblings of a madman, someone from the crowd said. But then Nicholas Flamel's voice interrupted. I believe him. Everyone turned, unable to understand why this story could make this elder believe. In fact, I haven't told you, but his second name sounds very familiar to me. A couple of decades ago, when I was in the mountains searching for ancient ruins, I met a young guy, around 16. By my senses, he was a squib, but he had a very distinct fire energy and he was clearly physically stronger than ordinary people. So, that guy's name was Norin. Then you probably met my father, Mr. Flamel. You see, my father, in his youth, was very fond of Lady Ursa, the Fire Lord's wife, and wanted to marry her. But it was an imperial decree, and he couldn't oppose it. For some time, he lived in the forest in the mountains. Mr. Nicholas, I think you may have accidentally entered my world, or my father was in this world for some time but I definitely came here from the Earth Kingdom. It's very strange that there are interdimensional passages in the Fire Nation too. Asmodeus, you didn't mention who your mother is, since you talked about your father, can you tell us about your mother? I would if I knew, but my father never spoke about her. I only know that she died right after my birth, and left me her last name. Asmodeus said a bit sadly. Regardless of whether it's the first life or the second, or even the tenth. You'll love your family regardless of circumstances they're your blood. Sorry, the old man said. It's okay, you didn't know, and you couldn't. Then Asmodeus intervened. Now that Nicholas can confirm certain aspects, I think we can agree that what Asmodeus told us is true. But what do we do with this information? Won't the Fire Nation bring its army into this world? Someone said, but Asmodeus interrupted. You don't have to worry about that. In the next twenty years, the Fire Nation will be at war with the whole world. They won't have time to explore their own mountains in search of a passage to another world they don't even know about. So you don't have to worry. Besides, according to my information, the Avatar didn't die but is simply sleeping somewhere near the Water Tribe's shores. How do you know that? I also have a certain gift of prophecy, Asmodeus said slyly. Well, I even know the future of this world, not to mention one of my favorite childhood cartoons. Okay. Actually, that's not the main thing now. I think we'll have more time to discuss my past, but right now, we're talking about the future of this world, Asmodeus said, trying to steer the conversation back on track. Yes, calm down, friends. At the moment, we don't know the conditions for entering that world or where the passage is. Let's solve problems as they come. Right now, we're on the brink of global world changes, and we should focus on our world rather than some distant future of another world. Dumbledore supported him. Let's hear you out, Mr. Morningstar, said Armando Dippet. This time, he didn't call him a child, now it's Mr. Then I'll continue. I've already told you everything I can about the magic circle. Now I want to talk about how to introduce it to the world. Yes, that's a big problem. Neither the Muggle governments nor the pure-blooded families will be pleased if you suddenly announce your invention to the world. I know, 
so I came up with a way to solve the problem on the Muggle side. What about pure blood families? Someone asked. I actually don't like the ideas of blood purity. In my opinion, only livestock breeders or dog kennels should be concerned about blood purity. So if they interfere, they can be eliminated. Asmodeus said firmly. The aura he emitted made the hair of some unseasoned fighters among this old fella stand on end. Mr. Morningstar, isn't there another way? Dumbledore asked, reluctant to resort to bloodshed. Principal, I understand your desire to resolve everything peacefully, and I'm not against the idea of nobility itself. But I believe that nobles should earn their influence and status through exceptional deeds, not the so-called pure blood obtained through incest, Asmodeus replied. Remember how many families from the so-called Sacred 28 helped in the fight against Voldemort? Only the Weasleys. And how many of them joined the ranks of Death Eaters? Almost all of them. So, if they don't interfere with my plans, I won't touch them. But if they decide that I'm an easy target and try to hinder me, I have no problem ensuring that only a couple of families remain from the Sacred 28. Anyway, in their current state, they are a cancer on the magical world. Actually, Asmodeus isn't concerned about the so-called pure bloods at all. He views them as either hindering or supporting him based on their actions. However, the idea of pure blood superiority is deeply rooted in the magical world. For instance, getting a decent job or a position in the Ministry of Magic for a Muggle-born is many times more challenging than even for a half-blood. Just so you know, Hermione in the original story became the Minister of Magic with the Weasley surname, not the Granger surname. Such a state of affairs is unacceptable if he plans to develop this world. Although he doubts the possibility of bringing the world to meritocracy, he thinks it's the direction in which he wants to move the world. He understands that completely eliminating the factor of connections and kinship from interpersonal relationships is impossible, but he wants to ensure a fair assessment of talents among muggle-born wizards and those who become wizards thanks to the magic rings. All right, we're getting too far ahead. Let's get back to the muggles, Newt's commander said attempting to conclude the topic. His best friend, Jacob Kowalski, is a muggle, and he has always wanted the opportunity to learn magic. So, he was very pleased when he heard the contents of Dumbledore's prophecy, and that's why he joined this impromptu gathering. He wasn't particularly concerned about the fate of the 28 families, although he dislikes bloodshed and is close to nature. He clearly knows the law of the jungle only the strongest survive. Moreover, he is well aware of the evil caused by these families and feels no guilt about it. Thank you, Mr. Commander. I'll continue. As I mentioned earlier, talented and not-so-talented muggles, with the help of wizards, will be able to form the magic rings. But muggles unfamiliar with magic will naturally fear the addition of wizards to their ranks. Members of the muggle government will be especially concerned because they effectively transfer people who previously obeyed their laws into the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Magic. Although this won't be noticeable in the early stages, it could begin to worry them later on. But now that I have a lot of free hands, I've found a solution to this problem. Although what he's planning contradicts meritocracy directly, it will only be the case for a certain period until magic becomes fully accessible, and the governments of ordinary people will be assimilated by the magical world. I suggest we contact all the high-ranking figures in the muggle world politicians, billionaires, businessmen, remaining royal families, and so on. We'll propose to them and their children to become wizards and extend their lifespans, provided they support us in our endeavors. This way, we'll get the first batch of new generation wizards in the form of influential muggles and their children. By doing this we also pull them to our side in the confrontation with radical muggles. Regarding the process of teaching muggles, I believe these influential individuals will be pleased to cover all expenses for the construction of the Hogwarts Institute of Magical Research under my name. This way, we can avoid mixing muggles and wizards in the early stages to prevent conflicts. Additionally, we'll nurture talents for their future recruitment into the same institute. I think the education system in the magical world is extremely limited, causing wizards to stagnate rather than progress. The institute will financially support and assist new wizards, as well as natural-born wizards who choose to stay after their education and offer their knowledge to the world. What do you think about this? There was no immediate response, but applause echoed throughout the hall. Well done. Even at twenty, you handle things like an old fox, no worse than Dumbledore, words from Nicholas Flamel and Newt's commander echoed from the crowd. Dumbledore felt as if he had been stabbed with a knife. Ahem, ahem, aggressively clearing my throat. Greetings, everyone. It's me, your humble servant and the author of this fanfic. 
I am truly delighted by how you, the readers, have reacted to my first book. The level of support you've shown me is incredibly meaningful. I believe I can maintain a consistent daily update schedule for one chapter, but I also ask for your understanding. I have a job and I'm preparing for university admissions, I can't dedicate all my time to writing the book. For these reasons, I've decided to create a Patreon. I work as a freelance translator, and having an additional source of income would allow me to take on fewer translation projects and focus more on writing the book. There won't be paid chapters or additional content on Patreon, but I would be grateful for your support. This way, I can concentrate more on the book and release more chapters. So, without further ado, I present to you my Patreon. HTTP colon slash slash Patreon dot com slash the underscore last underscore airbender library. I've set up two subscription options for those who want to support me. The $5 subscription doesn't offer any extra benefits compared to the $2 one, it's just for those willing to support the author with a larger amount of money. I'll emphasize once again, there won't be paid chapters on Patreon, at least for this book. I created it for those who genuinely enjoy this book and want it to continue with stable updates. Wishing you all a wonderful day, happy reading, and see you again, folks. Asterisk colon. Chapter 21, Voldemort After the meeting, Asmodeus and the group of old wizards exchanged contact information and agreed that the elders would take on the task of contacting magical officials from different countries and inviting them to a meeting next month. Asmodeus was surprised to learn that almost every government in the world and major company had a wizard employee. They assist with protection and security, guarding against both other wizards and non-magical threats. Therefore, reaching out to officials wouldn't be a problem. It turns out even the English royal family has a court wizard, who was present at today's event. So, when most attendees had already dispersed and only two Dumbledores, Grindelwald, McGonagall and Asmodeus remained in the bar, Asmodeus said. Principal, I need to speak with you privately. Everyone here is on our side, Mr. Morningstar. You don't have to hide anything, unless it's something personal. I've heard about your unusual relationship with Miss Granger. Asmodeus responded with a fishy glare. Omega. All right, I'll go. I really wanted to tell you why Voldemort is still alive and how to kill him. What, what? Oh, it's nothing. I'll be going. Dumbledore, degree degree LL, slash. As Asmodeus turned and was about to leave the bar, he felt a hand on his shoulder. Dumbledore. Asmodeus, get away, you're repulsive. Seeing Asmodeus openly disdainful, Dumbledore clutched his chest. When had he been so openly scorned? Dumbledore. Grindelwald, Omega, Omega. Mr. Morningstar, don't be so critical. It's just a joke, haha, Grindelwald interjected. Oh, so the first Dark Lord wants to get rid of the newcomer. Grindelwald, underscore, I think I'll go to a corner and draw circles. Underscore underscore. Minerva McGonagall looked at this scene strangely and said. Mr. Morningstar, stop mocking them please. Tell us about the one whose name cannot be pronounced. Fine, but only because you're a very good teacher, unlike the headmaster and the criminal. Dumbledore and Grindelwald, clutching their chests, why are you doing this to us? Cough McGonagall cleared her throat. So, what do you mean by Voldemort him not being dead? Asmodeus looked surprised at Dumbledore. So, this schemer didn't tell you. Well, it makes sense. Do you know why he brought the Philosopher's Stone to the school? To protect it, of course, so it wouldn't fall into the wrong hands. Professor McGonagall, you're too trusting. Do you really think Nicholas can't defeat Voldemort? He's 600 years old and an alchemist. His house has long become an impenetrable labyrinth. Actually, Dumbledore has two goals, to lure Voldemort and test our savior, Mr. Potter, or rather, the spell Lily Evans cast on him. Dumbledore, is that true? She asked, looking at her old colleague with an assessing gaze. Um, yes, but Minerva, it's really necessary. Everyone in the room, except Grindelwald, who was drawing circles with his finger in the corner, went silent for a moment. Don't come near, you're repulsive, Omega. Dumbledore felt a heart attack approaching. Asmodeus, all right, regarding Voldemort, you already know that I have the gift of prophecy. So, I'll say it straight, according to what I saw. Voldemort created seven Horcruxes Tom Riddle's diary, Marvel O'Gaunt's ring, Salazar Slytherin's locket, Helga Hufflepuff's cup, Rowena Ravenclaw's diadem, Nagini, and Harry Potter. 
I saw this prophecy when I was in the Avatar world, so I don't know when Voldemort created the Horcrux Nagini the snake. He infused a part of his soul into her. And yes, you didn't mishear Harry Potter is indeed a Horcrux of Voldemort. He's insane, splitting his soul seven times. Now I understand why he changed so much since he came to me, Grindelwald murmured quietly. Now I see why he didn't die, but what do we do with this? In the prophecy. Before Dumbledore could finish, Asmodeus said, I know what the prophecy says, and I won't interfere with your obsession. I have an idea, whether you use it or not is up to you. Dumbledore nodded. Gather all the Horcruxes together, and I'll let you know where they are and how to safely obtain them. Then use the Fiend Fire spell to burn them. It can destroy Horcruxes. Afterward, continue with your plan to capture Quirrell. Let Harry touch Quirrell, and the protective spell will work, killing Quirrell and leaving only Voldemort's soul, which you can also burn with the Fiend Fire spell. If we're lucky, only one Horcrux will remain, Harry. If not, there will be two, Najini and Harry. I have a way to destroy Voldemort's soul without harming Harry. When I separate the soul from Voldemort, Harry will use the Fiend Fire spell and fulfill the prophecy. He said this mentally, looking into the trading center system. Astral Soul Spell, from the Book of Vision T. White Magic, optimized for the Harry Potter world. Cost, 500 points. Current balance, 260 points. All right, I agree with your approach. Asmodeus rolled his eyes, you initially wanted Harry Potter and Voldemort to kill each other. Okay, then listen. The first Horcrux is located. So, after 15 minutes of uninterrupted speech, Asmodeus finally finished talking. Can you resist the temptation of the Resurrection Stone? He asked, looking at Dumbledore seriously. I'll go with him, said Grindelwald. Oh yes, your old lover is still here. Well, I won't interfere. Professor McGonagall, when using the flu network, do I shout Deputy Headmaster's office at Hogwarts? Yes. I'll go with you. Leaving two offended old gays and one sad old man, Aberforth, Asmodeus, and Professor McGonagall left the Hogshead Inn. In Professor McGonagall's office. Mr. Morningstar, I think there's no need for you to attend first year classes. I'll inform the professors that starting tomorrow, you can freely choose the courses to attend. Thank you, Professor McGonagall. I was just about to ask you to transfer me to the third year. But that's even better. Of course. Mr. Morningstar, considering your breakthrough in rune science, I think Professor Bath's Hata babbling would be willing to take you as an assistant, or even learn from you. No, no, that's too much. I'm not that good yet. Asmodeus said shyly. So, from the next day, students noticed something strange there was a student who clearly didn't belong to their class or even their year, attending their classes. However, the professors didn't seem to mind and even gave him points. Moreover, Gradually, people found out who he was a first-year student. But the students from Ravenclaw and Greyfinder were shocked for a different reason. During an extra class on the study of ancient runes, senior students from different classes sat with open mouths, watching as the child and the professor argued about something they couldn't understand, holding sheets of paper in their hands. Professor Babbling This rune definitely means to build, not to dismantle. Look at this text. Asmodeus shouted. You little one, what do you know? If you put the word to dismantle here, the sentence won't make sense. While this was happening, a Greyfinder asked a Ravenclaw, what are they talking about? I have no idea, but it's very interesting, someone behind them replied. Chapter 22, Changes While Asmodeus delved into the depths of magic at Hogwarts, on the surface of the Muggle world, everything seemed calm. However, that was just on the surface. Buckingham Palace November 10, 3 p.m. Prime Minister of England, Sir John Major, nervously paced the room. The Queen watched his restless movements with a smile. Sir John, why are you so agitated? Relax, sit down, and have some tea with me. Your Majesty, thank you, but I'm nervous about why the greatest white wizard of this century contacted you and me for a meeting. Moreover, he did it by passing the Ministry of Magic. A year ago, when I was told that wizards exist, I was shocked and didn't believe it at first. But after seeing all the documents and talking to the Minister of Magic in England, I was able to accept it. And now, someone they call the greatest wizard of the century asks for a meeting with you and me. It's naturally for me to be nervous. Prime Minister, 
calm down. Mr. Dumbledore was introduced to us by our court magician, Sir Russell William Bedford. His family has served as our protectors for 300 years, and they are extremely loyal. He wouldn't have called us if there was any danger. I hope so. John nervously replied. His words halted as the doors to the room opened, revealing two elderly gentlemen. One appeared to be around the Queen's age 60 to 65 years old, and the other, with a long beard, looked like an ancient wizard in John's imagination. The tall, thin, and very old wizard with silver hair and a beard, both so long that he could tuck them into his belt, caught John's attention. His blue eyes shone brightly from beneath half-moon-shaped glasses perched on his long, hooked nose, which appeared to be broken in at least two places. Dumbledore wore his favorite long robe, a lilac cloak, and buckle shoes. While the Prime Minister contemplated, the two old men entered the room. They paid their respects to Her Majesty and greeted the minister. After completing the formalities, the Queen asked, Sir Bedford, could you please tell me why this esteemed wizard has requested a meeting with me and our Prime Minister? Your Majesty, I believe it's better for him to personally explain the purpose of his visit. Especially considering that what he will say may change the world. Upon hearing the words of the court magician, the Queen and the Prime Minister turned their heads in surprise towards Dumbledore. In that case, I would really like to hear what you are going to talk about. I am very interested in what our court magician considers something that could change the world. Then, with your permission, Your Majesty, what do you know about magic and wizards? I know about as much as the average employee of the Ministry of Magic. We still maintain contact with the Ministry of Magic in England and must understand your existence. As for magic itself, almost nothing. I only know that wizards awaken their magic before the age of eleven. When I was quite young, I hoped to become a witch like in my grandfather's stories. Unfortunately, whether due to my lineage or something else, I never became a witch. But instead, I became a queen, the queen said a little sadly. The royal family of England is like a talisman, but it is useless. They can be likened to an expensive keychain for house keys it looks beautiful, but it's useless. Because of this, after 65 years of life as a keychain, the queen naturally longed for what these witches and wizards had freedom. While the status of secrecy imposes limitations on wizards, in practice, Newt managed to embark on a journey to the other side of the world using muggle transportation without concern for consequences. Wizards like Harry Potter should not worry about food, water, or finances in the muggle world. Everything, except for food, they can attain through the enchantment of spells, the kind of freedom many of the world's top officials crave. Unfortunately, they love power much more. Upon seeing the Queen's expression, Dumbledore understood something and asked, Your Majesty, what if I tell you that you have the opportunity to become a witch? Are you joking, Headmaster Dumbledore? I am completely serious. I came here today to invite you to a meeting that will take place in two weeks and to tell you about a new technique invented by a Hogwarts student that allows non-magical people to become wizards. Then, Headmaster Dumbledore, please tell us about it. Already not hiding her eagerness, the Queen said. Five minutes later. In this way, muggles will be able to make their hearts produce mana and become wizards. What do Your Majesty and Prime Minister think about this? Yes, yes, of course, yes. Almost simultaneously, the two representatives of the English elite, having long lost their composure, replied. Who would refuse such an opportunity? Give them the chance to become a wizard, extend their lifespan, strengthen their bodies. Anyone who rejects this is either an idiot or already a wizard. Then, I believe you will be pleased to come to the Hogshead Inn, don't worry about the word bar and the name of this establishment. At the moment, several wizards are working on its renovation, preparing it for the visit of high guests. On November 24 at 12 o'clock, we will be waiting for you there. I think I should leave you now, I have a few more places to visit. Dumbledore said and disappeared. Your Majesty, what do you think? The world will change if everyone becomes a wizard. Are you sure you want to support these changes? Sir John, you still don't understand. Changes will happen anyway, with us or without us. But wizards give us a chance to maintain our position by providing early warning. I think, according to the wizard's plan, you want to contact all the top authorities in the world. She said, turning her gaze to the court magician. You are right, my lady. Wizards under the command of Dumbledore and Grindelwald are already contacting the governments of magical and non-magical nations around the world. They are also in contact with many billionaires and millionaires at the moment. The Queen nodded. Indeed, 
Dumbledore was far from the only envoy. Such conversations, as just happened, were taking place in almost every government building in the world. In fact, almost everyone present at the meeting took it upon themselves to contact one or two countries. Dumbledore just took on a few more families. Two weeks later, Asmodeus set out for the meeting. Chapter 23, Encounter November 24, 1145 Boom! Asmodeus, along with Dumbledore and Fox, appeared at the door of the Hogshead Inn. Previously, the Hogshead Inn was a small, dark and very dirty room that strongly smelled of something, possibly goats. The windows were so covered in dirt that very little daylight could penetrate the room, which was instead lit by the flickering candles on rough wooden tables. The Hogshead was known for its bad reputation, often frequented by dubious characters. Due to the shady nature of the place, it was fashionable for customers to conceal their faces. Now, everything has changed dramatically. After two weeks of reconstruction and magical assistance, the bar had transformed into a vast conference hall reminiscent of a Roman amphitheater. Thanks to the countless extension charms applied inside the bar, the space could now accommodate 2,500 people. Upon entering, you are greeted by the reception desk, with the boar's head hanging above it, the only reminder of the building's past purpose. Behind the counter is a staircase leading upstairs to guest rooms for potential visitors. Previously, even the darkest wizards wouldn't have stayed here due to the extreme dirtiness. Now, these rooms resemble those of a five-star hotel in the Muggle world. Looking to the right of the stairs, you'll see an entrance leading to the conference hall. To save on furniture or to evoke an ancient atmosphere, the conference hall consists of a performance platform surrounded by tiered seating for the audience. They were not made of stone like in ancient times but were covered in the skin of some magical creature. An enchantment on the ceiling similar to the Hogwarts dining hall, simulated the night sky, allowing you to feel like you are in ancient Rome, a time when wizards were the most important advisors to emperors, and almost everyone knew about magic, and wizards didn't need to hide. While Asmodeus was assessing the rebranding of the Hog's Head Inn, the Muggle elite and a small number of wizards gradually filled the rows of seats. Among them, Asmodeus saw a diverse group of people, from members of royal families and nobles to business magnates and scientists. This assembly brought together people from all walks of life, but most importantly, all the present are elite who influenced the lives of ordinary people. If these people supported their actions, their plan would face no obstacles on the Muggle side, meaning guaranteed success. Not that there couldn't be opponents to his ideas in the wizarding world, but he was confident that in the worst case, he could simply kill anyone who resisted. In the Muggle world, it wouldn't work that way. There were too many non magical people, and as soon as someone from the top died, it would turn everyone else against them. Moreover, this assembly plays a crucial role in his current research. After Asmodeus absorbed knowledge about runes from books, he could read ancient texts and extract information from them. From these ancient texts, he understood that magic was much stronger and more potent in the past. The most powerful wizards of ancient Egypt could incinerate a city of 100,000 people with a single spell, and it wasn't even fiend fire, just ordinary fire. Over the last two to three weeks, he had been trying to find an explanation for why the density of magic in space was depleting. During his research, he discovered that after the introduction of the secrecy law in 1689, magic began to rapidly lose its strength. Even the requirements for Hogwarts students significantly decreased. Take shield charms as an example. Currently, only Aurors are required to know this spell. It's not even part of the mandatory Hogwarts curriculum anymore. But a hundred years ago, Protego was a condition for advancing to the sixth year. Even earlier, before the introduction of the secrecy status, this spell was taught in the third year at Hogwarts. Asmodeus believes that such a decline in the magical world is directly linked to the secrecy status. If, immediately after the introduction of the secrecy law, many muggles sincerely believed in witches and magic, considering electricity a witch's doing, then, after hundreds of years, people began to see magic as mere fantasy. Asmodeus's idea is that since the magic in this world is inherently idealistic and, at the initial stages, does not require strict training and research, up to a certain level of development, magic in the world of Harry Potter resembles instinctive actions of wizards, and mostly relies on the desire of the wizard, it also depends on the number of people who know about magic and sincerely believe in it. In other words, because of the secrecy status, fewer and fewer people believed in magic, and magic gradually weakened until it reached today's level where there are no more than three million wizards worldwide. Furthermore, now understanding the ancient writings, Asmodeus saw that in ancient times, 
there were completely magical cities, not one or two, but several dozen. Each of them had hundreds of thousands of wizards at that time. Even Atlantis once existed and disappeared relatively recently, about 400 to 600 years ago. The founders of Hogwarts even left records of their journey to Atlantis. It was a floating island held afloat by the magic of twelve wizards of the same level as the four founders of Hogwarts. But due to the witch hunt, Atlantis cut off all contact with the world, and without magical energy support, it eventually sank. This meeting will allow Asmodeus to understand if his theory is true. In three weeks, he and Professor Bats had a babbling, the study of ancient runes, developed a tool that roughly determines the saturation of space with magical energy. Currently, the device shows 0.5 units of magic per square meter with an error of 0.01 particles. Asmodeus asked the system how much he could increase the density of magical energy in the world at once, and it replied by 5 units. This means that one increase in the world's level through the system will bring 10 times more magic into the world than it is now, no wonder such an improvement costs 10,000 points. While Asmodeus contemplated, all seats were already taken, and muggles had begun whispering to each other. Therefore, Grindelwald decided it was time to start. He was chosen for the introduction as he was the most experienced in public speaking. He approached Asmodeus and said, Are you ready? I'll make the introduction, but the task is yours afterward. Are you not nervous? Don't worry, whether it's this bunch of old folks or these 3,000 people, the feelings are the same. I can handle it. Good, then I'm off, people are already waiting. Good luck. After waiting for Grindelwald and the others to leave, Asmodeus took out some potion from his pocket. Well, I can't go on stage looking like a 13-year-old, I need to show them why I was considered the heartthrob of the Fire Nation. On stage. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, kings, queens, nobles, sheiks, and distinguished scholars. We are pleased to welcome you all here at the Hogshead Inn, at the first Congress of the New World. Applause echoed in the hall, and it was well deserved. Grindelwald, resembling Johnny Depp, possessed unlimited charisma that even affected muggles. You have all gathered here for one thing. This. As Grindelwald said this, blue flames appeared around him, transforming into various animals that roamed the hall. Magic. You are all here for magic. For something you, for some reason, did not possess. But today, you have a chance to feel it and become wizards yourself. Grindelwald shouted the last words, and the audience didn't lag behind with most wizards already standing and applauding, anticipating further performance. But I believe I am not worthy to tell you about the method of obtaining magic because today, in our presence, is the creator of the magic circle. Please welcome him, Asmodeus Norin Morningstar. When his words fell, the blue flame on the stage disappeared, and a dark red, burgundy-tinted flame took its place. A fiery path appeared between the rows of seats, and Asmodeus descended from the top of the amphitheater. When he turned around, people saw a figure that was difficult to describe in words. They saw a man wearing a vibrant red robe with a loose, flowing design. His long hair cascaded down his shoulders, framing the face. He looked gentle and aggressive at the same time, with a Scandinavian Slavic appearance, sharp, chopped features and an aggressive look. His dark brown eyes seemed to stare straight into the soul. Ascending the stage, Asmodeus declared, Greetings to all present. My name is Asmodeus Norin Morningstar and I am the creator of the magic circle. When his words resonated, all the women in the hall applauded while standing, and the eyes of the men burned with jealousy. It turns out that before stepping on stage, Asmodeus had consumed an aging potion, which restored his appearance to that of a twenty-year-old Fire Nation warrior, chased by countless women. Thanks to Mr. Grindelwald for helping me with the introduction. Now, I want to present my creation to you all. Chapter 24, Show Must Go On with a wave of Asmodeus's hand, fire appeared in the air, gradually forming a magical circle. You've all heard about something that can turn you into a wizard. Here it is, this magical circle. It will allow non-magical individuals to become wizards and wield magic. Moreover, and probably most important for many present, this magical circle will strengthen the body and increase lifespan. Once again, with the gesture of his hand, three brochures appeared in front of everyone. Asmodeus didn't think that anyone present would be interested in the research and the description of the circle-making process. That's why he made these brochures. They contain everything that you might need to know about building the circle, introducing magic into the body, and the runes used in the circle. In your hands are three brochures, a condensed version of my research. 
I don't think any of you want to read three books of three hundred pages right now, he said in a playful tone. Now, I ask you to read these three brochures, and after twenty minutes, you can ask any questions that may arise. If you don't understand a particular part of the text due to unfamiliarity with magic itself, you can approach the nearest wizard. When he said this, wizards stood up in each row and waved to the people in their sections. Twenty minutes later. I assume you've all finished reading and are eager to ask questions. That's why I'm here. Let's begin, shall we? Mr. On the right in the fifth row with your hand raised, please. Mr. Morningstar, honestly, I don't have any special questions. I would like to try this method right now. Ha ha ha, that's wonderful, ladies and gentlemen. Let's applaud this gentleman. Please, Mr. Bush. You are the President of the United States, am I right? Yes, that's exactly right, but I don't think this position is considered anything special among those present, ha ha, the President replied with a touch of humor. Ha ha, but isn't it good that there are more world leaders gathered here than at the UN summit? Asmodeus also replied with humor. Then please come to the stage, Mr. President. I will personally supervise your runic drawing. When George Bush stepped onto the stage, Asmodeus said, Mr. President, would you like to draw the circle yourself? I have chalk. Well, although I'm not sure I'll draw it correctly, let's give it a try. Besides, I won't be drawing from memory, I have this little booklet, he said, shaking the booklet in his hand. Don't worry about it. If there are any issues with the magical circle, I'll correct them. So, shall we begin? Yes, let's get started. I don't want to keep the whole world waiting, replied the President. I appreciate your humor, Mr. President. Well then, I wish you good luck. George Herbert Walker Bush took the chalk from Asmodeus and began drawing the magical circle. It didn't take much time, only about five minutes or so. Mr. Bush, to be honest, I am surprised. Although you traced it from the picture, you managed to draw the circle quickly and well. It's fully functional. Would you like to test it? How do we do that? Start introducing magic into the body. Mr. President, you're breaking my flow. Actually, I wanted to demonstrate this with a clear example, he said, pulling out a magic density meter from his pocket. See, right now, the sensor reads 0.53. Do you know what that means? He asked, not distracted by the confirmation of his assumption. If people believe in magic, the monodensity in the air increases. The audience nodded, expressing their curiosity and anticipation. All right, I won't prolong this. This sensor indicates the magic density per square meter. So, in the place where we stand now, the magic density is 0.53 per square meter. Now, let's place it inside the circle. Tell me, by how much should the density increase if the circle is successfully formed? He asked Bush. It's written in the booklet from four to five times. Correct. Well then, let's check how well you've drawn the magic circle. He placed the meter inside the circle. 2.2, a good result, Mr. President. You can start becoming a wizard. Ready. Honestly, I can't wait to try. Well then, sit with crossed legs and start feeling the magic. After a couple of minutes, I feel it, I feel the magic. That's wonderful. I must say, you're quite talented since you managed to do it so quickly. Of course, he didn't mention that he helped a bit because he didn't want to wait for him to sense the magic. You know what to do next. Mentally take this mana from the air and direct it into your body through the veins, towards the heart. Done. Now, the most important and dangerous part. Here, I'll assist you. I'm afraid England won't survive if the President of the United States commits suicide on its territory, Asmodeus joked. Done. Ha ha, I feel it. Feels like I'm twenty again. A fantastic sensation. Congratulations, Mr. President, you are one of the first non-magicians in the world to become a wizard. Congratulations. Now, where are your applause, ladies and gentlemen? I can't hear them. As his words landed, the entire hall erupted with thunderous applause. Mr. Bush, now you'll have to wait until we start producing magical weapons so you can use magic. Although. Given your talent, I think you'll be able to cast spells without a wand after some practice. Ha ha ha, you're joking, Mr. Morningstar. I'm definitely not that talented. Then, please, have a seat again, 
Mr. President. Now, I need to tell you about the precautions when using magic with the help of rings. Firstly, until you've built all three rings, after each use of magic, you'll need to meditate and restore magical power. Secondly, if you expend too much magic without building the three rings, you'll have to rebuild the rings and redraw the runes. Third and lastly, if you're not a wizard, please, form one ring per month. The last point is the most crucial. The body needs time to adjust, and overloading it for example, by building two or even three rings at once won't be beneficial. It might even harm your body from within as it won't have time to adapt to the magic. All of this is mentioned in the brochures, but I believe it's essential information that should be emphasized. So, who wants to be next? With these words, everyone in the hall, except for Bush, raised their hands. I have an idea. Let each of the attending wizards help me. Honestly, if we do this one by one, we might not have enough time, maybe not even several days. So, wizards who are familiar with the process, please raise your hand. About 70% of the wizards raised their hands, approximately 100 people. The others hadn't had a chance to familiarize themselves with the process as they were the last to be informed about the event. So, we're about 100 out of 2,500. Guys, you'll have to work hard. Although Asmodeus knew that most of the attending wizards worked for certain muggles, he still brazenly asked for their help and the help of the other people. Moreover, at their level, even if their countries were in conflict, they all communicated well behind the scenes. Chapter 25, Agreements Thanks to the wizard's assistance, everyone present successfully completed the construction of the first magical ring around their hearts in 3.5 hours. Now that everyone present is a wizard, I would like to present my plan for further development. To begin with, I would like to establish a magical school for the children of all those present here. Most likely, the first of the new generation of magical schools will have to be built in England. I understand the possible reluctance of certain countries to have the school in England, but I am currently in England and the majority of wizards who support our goal at the moment are in England. Are there any questions about this? Someone raised their hand. You, sir, go ahead. Mr. Morningstar, as I understand it, you want to teach our children magic and develop them. But this is not your ultimate goal, you want everyone in the world to learn magic, right? So why do you think the ministries of magic and we will support you? Don't you think that just a magical circle is not enough? You are absolutely right. But have you ever thought that if I provide this method to all non-magical people in the world through the internet or mass media? I reached out to you because I need your support, and in exchange, I am willing to give you and your families an advantage. If I were to release this methodology to the public, do you think you could maintain your power? As for the Ministry of Magic, well, they are just a group of nobodies that can be disposed of at any time. After these words, those few who had the idea of keeping the magical circle in their hands and not letting it spread realized how foolish they were. They were here only because of their status and financial resources, they were not essential for advancing the magical circle, just helpful. Ladies and gentlemen, please ask any questions that come to mind. We don't know when another opportunity like this will arise. Ah, there you are, milady, in the second row. Are you Princess Anna, right? Greetings to you, Mr. Morningstar. Yes, you are right, I am Anne Elizabeth Alice Louise. My question is probably the same as many others present, what financial and resource contributions do you wish to receive from us? Thank you for asking. Honestly, we don't need a particularly large sum in terms of finances, but we will need support in human resources. Since the distinguished individuals present are not very suitable for assistance in construction, we need each of you to allocate 10 trustworthy individuals and 200 kilograms of gold. I understand why you need people, and I believe that everyone here will be willing to provide their most trusted individuals with great joy. Of course, gladly. You think you can obtain some secrets and get closer to me, thought Asmodeus. But can you tell us why you expect financial assistance from us in the form of gold? Not that anyone here cannot fulfill this obligation, but gold has not been widely used as currency for a long time, and you are, in fact, asking for 500,000 kilograms of gold. Your Highness, Princess, you are right that in the non-magical world, gold is no longer as important. But don't forget, for wizards, the money of muggle banks means no more than scraps of paper. Can you explain why this is so? Anna asked. Ah, so that's your goal, you're simply thinking about how to earn money by transforming it from the muggle world into the magical one in advance. 
I would be delighted to answer your question. Does anyone present have a banknote or coin? Asmodeus addressed everyone in the hall, although it looked amusing that he was asking about money from the wealthiest people in the world. However, Miss Anna immediately handed him a fifty-pound banknote. Oh, thank you, Your Highness. Now, look, all of you see this banknote. And now, Gemino. When the words fell, from a small explosion an identical banknote appeared in front of everyone, indistinguishable in any way. Although the banknote numbers match, I don't think it's a big problem. A wizard can simply use different ATMs and deposit twice the amount into his account. Do you understand now? Then won't the same thing happen with gold? Someone in the hall said. No, 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 you don't understand, gentlemen. I'm not going to use gold to pay for services. I plan to convert this gold into the currency of wizards, Galleon. Can't you duplicate it with this spell? No, you can't. This currency is not made by wizards but by goblins. And at the moment, we are negotiating with the English branch of Gringotts, the bank owned by goblins, about cooperation. We want to get 50% control of the bank, provided that we can bring more investments into the bank. Why do goblins manage the wizard's bank? Someone asked with evident confusion. A very good question from the back rows. Actually, it's a result of historical events. Due to several wars, goblins are now not allowed to use wands and are only permitted to handle the financial aspects of the magical world. Additionally, money in the wizarding world is not an indispensable commodity. In simple terms, a wizard can easily live without using money at all, it's just that their standard of living would be lower. That's why wizards have never been overly concerned about it. But, as I mentioned, we are currently in negotiations with Gringotts and also aim to obtain licenses to open banks. In the future, those who wish to open their own banks will be able to do so, but you'll have to wait for about six months. Upon hearing Asmodeus's words, the prominent bankers nodded, not hiding their satisfaction. If there are no more questions, I'd like to return to the topic of the new magical academy and its construction. Thanks for listening. <laughs>